My name's Alex Tanner, and the mess I'm about to tell you about happened back in August of 2014. I'm a field operative for the CIA, the kind of guy sent in when things go sideways. The weirder the circumstances, the better suited I am for the job. I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of things, but nothing prepared me for the Adirondack Mountains. We were tracking some chatter about a rogue paramilitary group experimenting with genetic modification, supposedly messing around with animal DNA to create something off the books. My team was two other seasoned CIA agents, Novak and Ramirez, and a biologist, Dr. Walsh. We always brought a specialist along for jobs like these. Novak was ex-army rangers, built like a bear with nerves of steel. Ramirez, our tech specialist, was always cracking terrible jokes to lighten the mood. Dr. Walsh, though brilliant, was maybe the least outdoors a person you could imagine. Didn't stop her from complaining about how primitive our camp setup was. The Adirondacks are beautiful, but in an untamed, primal sort of way, thick with ancient forest and crisscrossed by old logging trails. We were deep in miles from the nearest sign of civilization. The local rumors were pretty outlandish something huge, with glowing eyes, attacking hikers and vanishing without a trace. I figured it was probably a bear, maybe infected with rabies, but orders were orders. We spent two weeks hunting for any sign of the supposed facility. Nights were chilly, the ground hard, and our packs were getting lighter. Morale was slipping, and even I was starting to think this was a wild goose chase. Then came the fourth night. I woke to a sound like someone dragging a wet sack of meat across the forest floor. I nudged Novak awake, and we listened in the pitch-black silence. Then we heard it again, a deep, scraping, snuffling sound that sent shivers down my spine. We woke Ramirez and Dr. Walsh trying to stay quiet, but it didn't matter. The thing knew we were there. I flipped on my night vision. The world outside our tents was washed in shades of eerie green. Novak whispered for Dr. Walsh to stay close. The clearing was dead silent, except for our own ragged breathing. And then it charged. The creature burst from the shadows, an unholy fusion of animal and nightmare. It was massive, twice the size of any bear, moving with unnatural speed and ferocity. Its eyes gleamed in the night vision like hot coals. It was all muscle and teeth, a patchwork chimera of coarse fur, ragged claws, and raw, pulsing sinew. The stench of it, rotting meat and something sulfurous, made me gag. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the night, but the creature barely flinched. It slammed into Novak, sending him sprawling, his gun flying from his hand. Novak screamed as the creature raked its claws across his back, tearing his pack open like it weighed nothing. Ramirez grabbed Dr. Walsh and bolted into the woods. Through the chaos, I caught a glimpse of the doctor fumbling with her pack pulling out a syringe. It's a sedative, she yelled over the beast's screeches. Just distract it. I fired another volley into the creature, more to buy them time than inflict any real harm. It roared and spun, giving chase to Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. I took the chance, sprinting across the clearing towards Novak, who was slumped against the tree. The creature was gaining, closing the distance with disturbing speed. Ramirez tossed a flare behind it, a burst of bright red light in the sea of night vision green. The creature paused, confused, and Dr. Walsh seized the moment. She ran in with surprising agility, burying the syringe in the monster's thick hide. The effect was almost immediate. It faltered, let out a shuddering, strangled cry, then lumbered a few more steps before collapsing into the undergrowth. I reached Novak, 
Blood was seeping through his jacket from deep gashes across his back. He gritted his teeth in pain, but his eyes were wide with a manic sort of energy. What the hell was that thing? he rasped. I don't know. I breathed, scanning the woods for any sign of our teammates. But whatever it was, it's down for now. Ramirez and Dr. Walsh emerged from the trees. The doctor was shaking, her face pale. Did it get you? she asked, scanning Ramirez for wounds. He shook his head, still catching his breath. Just then, we heard a rustling nearby. Our guns swung up, our nerves stretched to breaking point. But it was just a deer, its eyes wide with terror as it bolted past our camp, fleeing whatever horrors lurked deeper in the woods. The morning air crackled with tension. The sedative wouldn't last long, and we weren't sticking around to find out what happened next. Novak needed urgent medical attention. His wounds were ragged and dangerously deep. We rigged up a makeshift stretcher and started moving, hoping to reach the extraction point before nightfall. Dr. Walsh took tissue samples from the downed creature while the rest of us patched each other up as best we could. Her hands were shaking, a mix of residual terror and scientific fascination. Can you make any sense of this? I asked, nodding at the hulking mass. She held up a vial of blood, its color an unnatural, murky maroon. The closest I can figure, it's like a mix of wolf Bear, maybe something I don't even recognize. But there's more. Trace elements I can't identify. Whatever they were doing in that lab, it tampered with the very building blocks of this thing's DNA. That explained the speed, the ferocity. It wasn't an animal in the normal sense. It was something engineered, a weapon disguised as a wild beast. Trekking through the dense woods was agonizingly slow, especially hauling Novak. We swapped carrying the stretcher, our progress growing more halting as exhaustion set in. Dr. Walsh kept muttering to herself, analyzing every rustle of leaves on the breeze. She was convinced that there were more of the creatures out there, and with the sedative wearing off. Ramirez, usually the most light-hearted of the group, was unusually quiet. He kept glancing over his shoulder, a sheen of nervous sweat on his face. Finally, as dusk painted the forest in shades of gloom, he burst out. I can't do this anymore. We're sitting ducks. It'll be back, and next time. He didn't finish, but his fear was a palpable thing, squeezing at my own heart. We argued into the night, tension simmering. Ramirez wanted to split up, each of us trying our luck alone in the dark woods. Novak, despite his injuries, insisted we stick together, saying it was our best chance. Dr. Walsh drifted away from the argument, mumbling equations about rate of dosage and the unknown time until the sedative wore off entirely. In the end, we compromised. It was a foolish compromise born of desperation, but it was the only thing we could all agree on. We would stick together until daybreak, then reassess. At least in the dawn light, we might be able to see our enemy coming. Sleep that night was fitful and riddled with nightmares. Every groan of a tree branch had me snapping awake, gun raised, expecting to see glowing eyes in the darkness. Come morning, we were ragged, physically spent and emotionally frayed. But alive. The creature hadn't found us. Yet. We were less than half a day's journey from the extraction point when disaster struck. We were traversing a narrow ridgeline, dense forests closing in on both sides, when a growl like rolling thunder split the air. The creature crashed out of the trees above us its massive weight cracking branches and sending showers of leaves fluttering as it landed directly in our path. Its yellow eyes were blazing now, fully awake and filled with a terrible, calculating hunger. 
and there was nothing wrong with it. No sign of the sedative. Walsh lied. Novak grunted, the pain making his voice rough. She never gave it anything. I didn't have time to process that betrayal. The creature surged towards us. It was even bigger now than the night before, its muscles visibly bulging with grotesque power. We opened fire, but our bullets seemed to do little more than annoy it. In the chaos, I stumbled backwards. I hit a tree root, and the world spun sickeningly. My gun skittered away, out of reach, as I watched in dawning horror as the creature bounded towards Novak and Ramirez. I heard their screams cut short, the wet cracking of bone, then silence. Blood splattered the forest floor, a grisly spray pattern painting the leaves. And then the creature was turning toward me, Dr. Walsh standing calmly beside it. This was always the plan, Alex, she said, her voice high and strained. A kind of manic energy gleamed in her eyes. Those men, expendable. Data collection. But you and this... She gestured to the creature. This is the breakthrough. It's beautiful, isn't it? The adaptability. The power. Rage coursed through me, a blinding, white-hot fury that banished the cold tendrils of terror. I lunged for my dropped sidearm, but the creature was faster. Its claws tore through my clothes and scraped across my chest. Pain slammed into me, and I cried out. Dr. Walsh laughed, the sound jarring against the stillness of the forest. See? She crowed. Progress, Alex. Incredible, unstoppable progress. The creature loomed over me. Its teeth were stained red with the blood of my friends. With the last of my strength, I kicked upwards, my desperate aim rewarded as my boots smashed into its snout and elicited a pained snarl. It stumbled back, opening a window of opportunity. I scrambled towards the extraction point fueled by desperation and the sickening knowledge that Dr. Walsh's madness had already claimed Novak and Ramirez. It's a long way back to civilization even without a genetically warped behemoth on your tail. I don't know how I made it. They found me staggering on the roadside, incoherent, my clothes a mess of mud and blood. The agency debriefs were brutal. They didn't fully believe my story— Blamed shock and trauma, but the bodies of Novak and Ramirez were proof enough that something monstrous had stalked us through those woods. Dr. Walsh was never found, and neither was that thing. Some nights I lie awake and think I hear the crunch of its footsteps under my window, the scraping of claws against stone. Maybe I'm paranoid, broken from what I saw that day. Or maybe there's truth to my nightmares. The Adirondacks still hold dark secrets, a primal evil unleashed by human arrogance. And I'm left haunted by the knowledge that it was one of our own who set those horrors free. This happened to me a few years ago. I still shudder to think about it. You know... I'm a pretty down-to-earth guy. I like to keep things simple. Don't buy into any of the supernatural stuff you see on late-night TV. But even after all this time, I have no earthly idea how to explain what happened out in the woods. My name's Rick, by the way. Back then, me and a couple buddies, Dan and Elliot, we used to hit the trails up by Lake Salish every few months. It was a great place— Dense forest, secluded, just a few hours' hike from the nearest road. We'd take enough food and gear for a long weekend, make a real escape of it. That particular trip, back in, well doesn't matter when, exactly, things got strange right from the start. See, we always hiked a different route into the heart of the forest, set up camp on the shores of the lake. But this time, 
we stumbled across this overgrown fire road, and something about it just called out to us. Dan, always the joker, says, Hey, fellas, how about an adventure on the beaten path for once? Now, this road wasn't on any map we had. It wound through the trees deeper and deeper than we'd ever ventured. The sun barely made it through the canopy, and by the second day, the air was damp and thick. Not ominous, exactly, but enough to raise those little hairs on the back of your neck. Then things started to change. We found it right in the middle of the trail half a deer. No, not like a hunter shot it and took the good bits. I mean half a deer, torn from front to back as smooth as you could cut it with a butcher's knife. No blood around it, no smell of rot. Just the other half missing without a trace. We stood there, frozen, not a word between us. Dan, bless him, broke the spell. Let's get out of here. Logic went out the window after that one. We should have turned around, found our way back. Instead, something twisted in my mind. There was an answer to this, somewhere on this damn road. We hurried on. An hour later, same type of thing, a man's torso, clothes on, laying like a discarded mannequin. No head, no legs, just gone. And still clean, fresh as could be. Elliot threw up right there on the path. The sun was dipping at that point. We made a panic camp, a tight little circle barely big enough for the tent. We weren't about to sleep with those, things out there in the dark. The night passed in terrified silence. Dan whispered the question on all our minds. What the hell kind of animal does this? No mountain lion or bear tears prey apart so neatly. We didn't sleep a wink. When the gray dawn finally broke, it wasn't a relief at all. Just a chance to see what we were dealing with. Elliot had completely lost it, blubbering, begging to turn back. I knew the road was madness now, but we couldn't leave him like that. Dan, ever the steady one, pulled out his pistol. Just for emergencies, he said, although we all knew it probably wasn't going to do much good against what we'd seen so far. Two hours later, we heard it a rustle in the trees, branches snapping. We huddled close, guns shaking a bit in Dan's hand. Then, it stepped out onto the road. I still can't fully describe the thing. It was tall, too tall on two legs but hunched like an ape. For black as night covered most of it, except for the head, that was all wrong. Like a dog's muzzle stretched out teeth glistening too long and sharp, eyes like twin burning coals. It froze for a long moment, just staring at us. Then a low hiss came from its throat, not an animal sound at all. We bolted. We didn't look back, didn't stop. It was faster, the crack of branches getting closer until a terrifying howl echoed right behind Elliot. He screamed just once, and then the forest went silent again. We stumbled out of the trees, bloody, bruised, barely sane. We flagged down a ranger, said there'd been an accident, an attack by a wild animal, anything but the truth. Elliot's never been found. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine that thing out there in the darkness, still walking the old fire road, searching. It's why I never go into the woods anymore. October 23rd, 2012 Always been the self-sufficient type, figured society had too many rules, too many ways to get a man caught up in its rat race. Found myself a plot of land up in Alaska, far off the grid, far from anybody's prying eyes. Built a cabin, learned how to live. Name's Riker. Alaska was paradise at first. Fished, hunted, spent my days surrounded by the raw beauty of the last frontier. Then folks started disappearing. 
a trapper, some tourists on an extended hike, all vanished without a trace. Rangers combed the area, didn't find much besides some half-eaten animal remains, bigger than any bear I'd seen. Rumors started swirling, folks whispering about strange footprints, unexplained howls in the night. I tried to ignore it, figure they were just stories. Then it came for Jed. Jed had a cabin tucked deep in the woods, mile or so north of my spot. Old-timer, mostly kept to himself, knew more about surviving out there than anyone. Found his place. Well, it was more like someone had exploded it from the inside out. Blood everywhere, chunks of. It was hard to tell what had been Jed and what had been whatever tore him to shreds. The smell. God. It wasn't something natural. Rotting meat, maybe, mixed with something fouler, almost chemical. That's when the dread settled in my gut. Took precautions, fortified my cabin, made sure my rifle was loaded, slept with one eye open. Nights were the worst. Alaska gets awfully dark in winter, and the silence wasn't that peaceful kind anymore. Every rustle of leaves... Every crack of a branch was it, circling, closing in. Finally, one night under a half moon, I saw it. Hunkered in the shadows at the tree lean, it was easily nine feet tall when it stood upright. Covered in thick, dark fur with patches of mange, its head seemed too big for its body, elongated, with a muzzle like a wolf stretched out long. Worst of all were the eyes. Even in shadow, they glowed with a pale green light, filled with a chilling hunger. We stared at each other, me desperately gripping my rifle, it seemingly sizing me up. Then, without warning, it let out a shriek that seemed to split the night in two, somewhere between a wolf's howl and a rusted hinge. It lunged towards me, moving with impossible speed, and I fired. Heard a roar of pain as the bullets hit their mark. For one terrifying moment, I thought that would be the end of it, but then the creature scrambled back into the trees, disappearing into the darkness. Spent the rest of the night clutching my rifle, listening to its ragged breathing and anguished howls echoing through the woods. By morning, the sounds were gone, but the snow was crisscrossed with tracks bigger than my two hands, and the rotten, chemical stench hung heavy in the air. Knew right then I wasn't safe anymore. Sold the cabin for a pittance. Barely took time to pack. Just started driving south. Didn't stop until I hit the lower 48. Ended up in some crowded, nameless city where the noise never ends. Can't stand the smell of car exhaust. Makes me think of that other smell. The one that clings to the back of my throat even now. Sleep doesn't come easy. My apartment has blackout curtains on every window, and the deadbolt on the door feels flimsy against the memory of the way my cabin shuddered that night. Sometimes, late at night when a siren wails in the distance, I close my eyes and see those glowing orbs in the darkness. I feel that a natural gaze on me, smell that rank, rotten scent. I wonder if it knows I'm here, if it followed my trail if it's only a matter of time before it finds me amongst the maze of concrete and steel. Folks up north have a name for it, the Neglotiae. Skinwalker, they say, but I think it's something older, something less human than those stories let on. It's out there, stalking the forgotten corners of the world, hungering for something it ain't meant to find. And somehow, it found me. This happened to me on July 22, 1993. My name's Miles, and I've been with search and rescue in the Olympic National Forest for over a decade. Love these woods, always have. Dad used to take me camping here when I was a kid, and the job just felt right when I got older. Funny how life works out sometimes, though. 
I got a call for a missing hiker named Declan, young guy, early twenties, on a solo trek. He had a pretty detailed route filed in, so I figured it'd be quick. Maybe he twisted an ankle, got off track, that kind of thing. First few hours on the trail were uneventful. Beautiful summer day, birds singing, all that stuff that makes you forget people can get into all sorts of trouble out here. That peace and quiet shattered around mid-afternoon when I stumbled across a fresh campsite. It looked like someone had abandoned it in a hurry, gear scattered about, ripped up food packets. That's when I saw the blood. My heart sank. There was a lot of it, sprayed across the ground, leading off into the trees. I followed the trail, hand on my sidearm. The deeper I went, the worse it got. Splatters on the tree trunks, bits of, well, I didn't want to think too hard about what it might have been. And then I found Declan, or what was left of him. It was like nothing I'd ever seen in all my years in search and rescue. He was mostly gone. What was there had been torn open in a precise way, organs removed with surgical precision. It wasn't an animal attack, not by a long shot. I was still trying to process the horrific scene when I heard it, a rasping cough from the undergrowth. I whirled around, and that's when I saw it. The creature was immense, at least eight feet tall. Its body looked skeletal, skin stretched tight over protruding bones. But the worst part was its head, narrow, elongated, ending in a sharp beak. Its eyes, those eyes were empty pits of darkness. A primal scream tore out of my throat. I fired my gun, more out of panic than any real hope of hitting it. The creature let out a piercing shriek and lunged. I ran for my life, stumbling through the trees, its inhuman screeches echoing behind me. I lost track of time. All I could think about was getting away. Eventually, I tripped, tumbling down a slope and landing hard in a creek bed. I must have passed out because when I opened my eyes, the sun was dipping below the horizon. I was alone. Somehow, I found my way back to the ranger station. They didn't believe a word of my story. A freak bear attack, they called it, said I was in shock. I wanted to argue, wanted to scream that I saw something out there that no one should ever see. But I knew it was useless. Got put on mandatory leave to recover. A polite way of saying they thought I was losing my mind. I didn't blame them. But that didn't make it any easier living with the memory of that thing's impossible form, those dead, black eyes. I took a transfer, ended up here in Arizona. Scrubland instead of rainforest, but the nightmares followed me all the same. Every time I hear a noise at night, every time a shadow moves just a little too fast, I freeze. I hear the locals talk about skinwalkers and other desert myths. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if what I saw was something like that. Something ancient, something unnatural. But in the end, I don't think it matters what name you call it. I ran into pure, hungry evil in those woods that day, and I just barely lived to tell the tale. They call the Olympic forests wild and mysterious, but there's some shadows out there even deeper than the trees— Shadows like the snare man, with his clicking beak and his hunger that burns like ice. Years went by before I could set foot in a boat again, hell, before I could even stomach the smell of fish. I'm Theron, retired park ranger now. Don't get none of that quiet, rocking chair retirement, though. Too many restless nights for that. See, folks think the Everglades are all pretty sunsets and birdwatchers. They don't know about the shadows under the sawgrass, the things that keep even gators wary. It started with the missing persons' cases. 
A lot of folks disappear in the swamp tourists who get turned around, old-timers swallowed by a sinkhole or a gator-filled pond. But this was different. Bodies weren't turning up, not even scraps. Like whatever got them, it left no trace. I was on the search crew for the first one, young couple, honeymooners. Went off one of the marked trails in Big Cypress Preserve, never came back. We found their backpacks, camera smashed to bits, but no blood, no sign of struggle. Rangers chalked it up to animal attack, maybe a panther that dragged the bodies off. I wasn't so sure. Word gets around, even in the sprawling mess of the Everglades. Other disappearances followed, always the same eerie nothing at the scene. Locals started whispering about the old stories. Something hungry out there, older than the gators. Something the Seminole tribes used to warn their kids about with campfire tales. Then it got personal. My partner on the search team, Brianna, well, she was tough as nails and twice as smart. Vanished on our watch. We were tracking some strange prints by an old fishing spot, oversized, clawed things that didn't fit any known critter in the park. I got distracted calling in the report, turned back and she was gone. Just like all the others. I quit the rangers soon after. Figured if Brianna couldn't make it out there, I sure as hell wasn't going to. But that guilt that ate at me like a damn parasite. Started hearing whispers, seeing things out of the corner of my eye. Brianna, her face pale and streaked with mud, standing by the side of the road on those nights when the fog rolled in thick. So, I did what any sensible man with too much liquor and not enough sleep would do, took my old service pistol and went back into the muck. Figured I'd either find what took Brianna and the others, or become whatever bait it was looking for next. Nights became my hunting ground. I knew those tangled waterways better than most. Learned to move silent as a ghost, to read the subtle rustle of the undergrowth that gave away movement. The thing, whatever it was, it was smart, damned smart. I'd feel eyes on me, catch glimpses of it slinking between the cypress trunks. It was tall, hunched even while standing. Skin hung loose on its bones, a sickly yellow-green, like something that crawled out from under a rotting log. But the head, that's what stuck with me. Narrow, flat skull and long snout, all teeth and black, beady eyes. One moonlit night I got my chance. It came for me, bold as you please, drawn by the scent of the deer carcass I dragged out as bait. I fired two, three shots echoing through the swamp. The thing screeched, a sound like nails on chalkboard. Didn't fall, though just bolted into the darkness, leaving a trail of blood that stank like a dead fish left in the sun. I followed the trail, flashlight beam cutting through the humid air, found it slumped against a half-submerged tree trunk. Got a clearer look then, really took in those bone-thin limbs, the claws like rusted fishing hooks dripping blood onto the moss. But even hurt, those eyes burned with pure, predatory malice. I raised my gun, hands shaking. Then I hesitated. Something wasn't right. It wasn't watching me like prey anymore. Its gaze flickered downward, to the shredded burlap sack I'd tied to the carcass. Inside were my collection of smashed cameras, bloody scraps of clothing, trophies of the people it had taken. Brianna's necklace glinted back at me, a tarnished silver turtle hanging askew. That's when I understood. It wasn't just a predator, it was a collector. Humans weren't its food, they were trophies, trinkets for its hoard. I lowered the gun. The thing let out a rattling breath, a mockery of relief. Then, with a jerky movement, it snatched up a shattered camera piece and vanished into the shadows leaving me alone with my grief and the certainty of fresh nightmares. These days I keep to the city, 
far from the echoing quiet of the swamps. Got a crummy apartment, a night security job. I see Brianna's face in the flickering of the street lamps on wet asphalt. I hear the rasp of its claws clicking on concrete in the alleyways. I know it's out there still, adding to its gruesome collection. The locals call it the Stiltskin Walker. Whatever its name, the important thing is this you go into those swamps, you keep your eyes on the shadows and your wits about you. Because you aren't the hunter out there. You're the prize. They found another one last week. Hiker on the outskirts of the Everglades, near where the pavement gives way to dirt roads and trailers. Only thing left was his backpack. Ripped to shreds, contents scattered. Camera was smashed, except for the memory card. I wasn't called to the scene officially, of course too long out of the game for that. But a buddy from the force slipped me the photos anyway. It was bad, worse than I ever saw as a ranger. Body wasn't just scavenged, it was disassembled. Pieces arranged in the trees like some twisted wind chime made of bone. And in the very last photo, blurred by the victim's shaking hand, was a hunched figure lurking at the edge of the frame. Yellow eyes gleamed in the dusk light, and I swore I saw a glint of tarnished silver caught in its long-clawed fingers. Some nights, I think I should go back out there. Track the thing to its lair, end it once and for all. Put the missing folks to rest, even if all that's left are bloody scraps and broken cameras. But then I remember what it does to folks it catches, and the old terror crawls back over me. See, it's one thing to die in the jaws of a beast. But to become a piece in its sick puzzle, a trinket hung in the trees to gleam in the swamp light. That's a fate I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. So I stay in the city, gun loaded under my pillow, security cameras of my apartment building rolling 24-7. I tell myself I'm being cautious, prepared. The truth is, I'm just as trapped as those it took into the swamps long ago. Only difference is, my cage is made of fear, and those yellow eyes watch it from the darkness just beyond the city limits. A few years back, I decided to take a road trip out to the southwest with my wife, Miriam. Been an outdoors a guy since forever, camping, hiking, the works. She's more into city life, but with some convincing, figured it would be good to share this side of me, experience that open desert space. My name is Ellis, by the way. Rented the beefiest SUV we could manage for extra peace of mind. Planned the route with a few national parks as the big destinations, then detours through smaller spots off the main highways. That's what gets you to those real secluded gems, right? Found one outside Canyonlands National Park in Utah on a map tucked away in a gas station rest stop. Looked ideal for backcountry camping. Permit stated as long as you stuck to designated areas by a winding river. Plenty of quiet trails winding through canyons. Figured a day or two there would be our roughing it highlight before hitting up motels at the more touristy places after. Should have seen the first red flag while getting there. The road ended with nothing but a rough dirt track heading off down a cliff. Figured maybe the main lot with restrooms got washed out during some flash flood recently. Headed down on faith hoping our rental company shelled out for good undercarriage insurance. That track dipped through a dry gulch, no other vehicles in sight. The place didn't feel empty exactly, it felt closed off, cut off from everything else. My wife noticed before I did said there weren't even any bird sounds. That quiet settled deep in my ears, an off-putting kind I was more used to from being high up a mountain, not out here in a desert. It turned into late afternoon by the time we found the designated sites. No water spigots, 
just some basic fire rings and flat clearings to pitch a tent. Fine can be rough for a bit. Had one of those pop-up tents, so getting that set up with Miriam didn't take long. Then came the second red flag. Wind kicked up like crazy while the sun still beat down. Not normal for these parts, I thought. Figured an oncoming storm, though not a cloud was in sight. Sunset took on a weird color I never saw before, a pale green tinge to the orange as it sank behind the canyon walls. That quiet deepened with the darkness. Miriam looked worried, not scared exactly, but like something put her on edge. I tried to make a joke about alien noises we haven't heard yet. Fell flat. We got some food down then turned in early, figured tomorrow's hike would erase that nagging wrong feeling. I didn't sleep well. Kept having those jolts when you dream you're falling, and every gust against our tent sounded like rustling footsteps. Then I finally dozed off for real when there came a knock. Soft but clear enough to pull me up. Figured other campers needed something, and that calmed me a bit. Miriam looked a bit scared, clutching the sleeping bag tight. I unzipped the tent door. No one out there. Nothing except the silence. It pressed against my eardrums. Figured my mind must be playing tricks. Still, a shiver ran down my spine as I zipped up the tent and lay back down. Couldn't get those weird sunset colors out of my head. That wrong light made something seem exposed out there, a shape you didn't notice until it was gone. Maybe the locals have strange tales about this place, I remember thinking. Would definitely ask on the way out, if those winds calmed down at all. We didn't have a restful hike the next day. Couldn't shake the feeling that eyes were on us, even before reaching the trailhead. Miriam agreed, started asking if we could move on to an actual park campground somewhere safer. That's when we found the note tucked under our windshield wiper. Crude handwriting, the message even worse. Just two lines, asterisk we knew you came. Go back before they notice asterisk. Didn't take much convincing after that. Packed up in record time, drove back up that track faster than was really wise. Kept staring at the rearview mirror, expecting to see someone, something, waiting on the canyon rim. Got out to the paved road, and even in that harsh noon sun, it felt like a weight lifted. Miriam made me stop at the first town along the highway. She did some frantic online searching on her phone found old local newspaper stories. About missing hikers, vanished at a crazy rate for such a sparsely populated area. Some bodies recovered, some just gone. And old articles in those tiny out-of-the-way papers hinted at local beliefs. Things that lived out where people didn't belong, shape-shifting monsters with eyes that shone with that same wrong-colored light. That unnatural sunset... I saw that glow before finding the note. Never went camping in a place marked only by a dot on the map again. No idea who pinned that warning under our windshield. Probably one of the park rangers, tired of dealing with folks who never came back. Don't blame them. Me and Miriam got lucky. Most people who go missing leave nothing behind but stories that nobody on the outside believes afterward. Maybe we saw one flicker in the shadows. Or maybe, it saw us, knew we weren't a real threat. Just two visitors passing through the territory of a skinwalker. It happened a couple of summers ago a spur-of-the-moment decision to spend some time out in the Olympic National Forest. My name's Kai, by the way. I used to work as a tech support drone in Portland, staring at a screen most of the day. Getting out into the real world is sort of my sanity reset. Hiking, climbing, 
solo camping when I get the urge for complete solitude. It wasn't my first rodeo in those woods, so there was nothing special about the trip at first. Well, except for what some idiot left scrawled on the backside of the trailhead signs. Some barely legible nonsense about watchers in the trees and don't wander from the path. I rolled my eyes. Probably bored teenagers trying to spook hikers. It's the kind of thing I might have found mildly amusing when I was younger. Now, it just annoyed me. The first two days passed without issue. Just me, the mountainsides, and a clear head. It rained like hell on the third afternoon, so I hunkered down under a tree line to wait it out. That's when I saw the prints. They weren't any animal I recognized, huge and vaguely man-shaped, but somehow off planted deep in the wet mud, and so fresh it could have been made minutes before. A little chill settled in the pit of my stomach, but I chalked it up to exhaustion and the damp air. No one could seriously walk the trail in this downpour without me hearing them, right? Wrong. As the rain finally let up, I caught a flash of something moving up on the ridge. Not an animal, too tall, too upright even at a distance. At first, I figured it must be someone else out for a hike, maybe got their directions wrong. I even called out, voice swallowed by the trees and dripping leaves. The figure stilled, and that's when my skin prickled with wrongness. Its form didn't just seem too large for a person, it wasn't quite solid. I couldn't put my finger on the exact quality but it was like the light warped slightly around it. Adrenaline kicked in then. Whatever I'd seen, it wasn't human. I'd been dumb to come this far alone. So much for that sanity reset. It shifted a little on the ridge line, turning its head my way. I scrambled back, tearing my pack off the ground with one shaking hand. I didn't run yet, because running invites a chase. Instead, I began backing slowly away, eyes fixed on it. Maybe if I was quiet enough, pretended not to be worth the interest, the thing lurched forward then, no human smoothness to its gait. I stumbled at that, and suddenly it was bounding down the slope at unnatural speed. I turned and bolted. That night was a frantic blur, scrambling through undergrowth, leaping fallen logs, heart and insistent drum in my ears, all while that damn rain returned in earnest. Branches whipped my face, and once, I swore I heard a heavy thud right behind me, echoing with something almost like a frustrated bellow. In the pre-dawn haze, I found myself back on the hiking trail. I pushed myself further. Every creak of the trees sounded like it. I stumbled and crawled more than I walked, driven by pure fear until, somehow, my feet carried me into the clearing by the ranger station. Collapsing in the mud was only half the relief. The other was seeing those normal, functional park service buildings, lights, other sounds, signs of civilization, and the ranger standing beside his vehicle, staring with wide eyes at my ragged state. His partner called the paramedics while he listened to my incoherent rambling about something large, something following me. No description I tried felt right. It was too fast, too big, too unyielding for normal words. The medics assumed stress, exhaustion, probably mild exposure. They were more right than I realized. At the hospital, they treated me for scrapes and bruises, dosed me with a sedative, and hooked me up to an four drip. It wasn't enough. Because just beyond the edge of my hazy thoughts, I sensed another presence. In the dark of the hospital room, I could feel eyes on me. Every nurse stepping in only confirmed, it wasn't here because of me. When I jerked awake the next morning, the news flashed across the small TV mounted on the wall. Something about a couple, campers gone missing from the nearby Lake Crescent area. I stared at the photo, 
young, smiling faces, the kind you could imagine sharing beers with while roasting marshmallows around a fire. I told the cops everything I saw, my fear and confusion amplified by their grim expressions. It felt like giving a statement about a nightmare, something you knew had happened but still found impossibly unreal. They seemed more focused on the fact I'd apparently made it down a good fifteen miles of trail by sunrise while claiming something stalked me in the night. Yeah, it didn't sound that great when I said it out loud either. They searched the area for the missing couple, of course. Found nothing but ripped up tents and splattered blood. No bodies, no sign of what made the mess, just an official record noting animal attack, species unknown, neatly closing the case. The news latched onto that, spun endless speculation, everything from bears to escaped big cats. I switched off the TV. Everyone needed a simple answer, but I could still see that thing bounding through the trees, its first slick with rain and an unfathomable hunger in its gaze. It was on one of those late-night deep dives into the darkest corners of the Internet that I discovered the word the others didn't dare utter, Bigfoot. I saw that the Olympic Peninsula, for all its wild beauty, had a strange history, missing person accounts stretching back decades, footprints never definitively matched to a known creature, those grainy half-seen photos that people either believed in wholly or mocked without reservation. Now, looking back with terror fresh in my memory, the puzzle pieces seemed to form a terrible kind of image. I live back in the concrete jungle now. Can barely even stomach walks in the city park. Sometimes, on the worst nights, if I let myself think of those vast, dark woods out there, I can almost see those glowing eyes on the other side of my apartment window. And I wonder, does it remember me too? The thing that got away? This happened to me back when I was just a kid. Maybe ten, eleven years old that blurry summer between being just a kid and the whole messiness of teenage years looming ahead. Me and my family used to go camping by Lake Wenatchee, Washington State. Those mountains, tall pines, that water so clear you could see fish sipping under your toes, you wouldn't imagine anything bad could happen in a place like that. Turns out, bad isn't picky about picturesque scenery. Back then, my whole world was bikes with my buddy, Devin, or helping with gardening at our house. That particular summer, the camping trip was the big highlight I circled on my calendar. Packed up the usual stuff, piled into our dad's old truck, and off we went, me, sis, always annoying twelve-year-old Maya, and my parents. Dad's an accountant, mom teaches at the local high school. Normal suburban folk, not survivalists or outdoors experts. That probably should have been a sign. Our RV campsite was in a decent spot, not too far from other groups. But a trail through the forest behind us held this pull for me, that promise of exploring new ground and feeling just a bit grown up and independent. Parents always nagged about sticking close, the usual, buddy system lecture I tuned out long ago. Devin, now there was a kindred spirit. No fear in him, always off on some mini-adventure. It rubbed off on me a bit, or maybe was always there waiting for an excuse. Second day, I wandered farther than ever before. Path just kept beckoning. Forests got thicker, dappled light and quiet pressing in from all sides. That weird thrill you get, part excited, part maybe a little nervous, good to feel some of that instead of mindlessly watching cartoons. Found a spot where an old logging truck had toppled on its side, vines creeping between the busted windows. This just screamed pirate ship in my kid head, had to climb on. Clambering and jumping and imagining buried treasure, well I slipped. 
smacked my ankle hard, sharp pain exploding up my leg. Limped along, trying to play it down, like, no problem, just a scratch. Finally realized my ankle was swelling and turning a funny color. Okay, now the worry settled in, had to make my way back. That's when I heard the scream. High-pitched, cut off suddenly. Figured it was just another camper playing games at first. Then, another, same, choked off, but there was something just wrong about it. Animal wouldn't sound like that, not right. Stood there frozen, ankle throbbing in time with my pulse. Something about those noises sent shivers up my spine. Took off limping back down the trail. It seemed every twist, every glimpse between the trees held some lurking threat. Came out back at our campsite, breath short, chest burning. Didn't see a soul. Thought maybe it was my imagination playing tricks. Maya didn't even look up from her stupid teen magazines long enough to give me grief. Mom, making sandwiches, was the first to spot my swollen ankle. One look, and all that usual mom calm turned to worry. Dad started peppering me with questions. Where, when, did I see anyone? They couldn't get through that forest fast enough, me hobbling in tow. By then, a park ranger truck stood beside the campsite. Ranger looked grim, the lines on his face etched deep. My heart beat so fast I thought it'd leave my body. Turns out, there was a reason for the empty clearing. Some hikers hadn't come back that morning. Dad kept repeating my story about the screams, his eyes flicking around like something dangerous was still close. The search didn't find the hikers that day, and the way the sun was dipping told me they'd call it off soon. My ankle was barely on my mind now. At dinner, under the pale glow of the battery-powered lamp, I could see the unspoken concern between my parents. Ranger had talked about wild animals, accidents, that stuff adults used to calm themselves down. In the shadows, every sound echoed a bit too loud. The wind through the trees sounded almost like ragged breathing. Something just fell off. It always does in those stories the older kids whisper around the campfire, right? But what if those whisperings aren't just for thrills? I didn't sleep at all that night. By dawn, search teams were out in full force. Dad joined them. Mom insisted on staying with us kids at the camper. Maya barely lifted her nose out of her book, so bored by the whole thing. Me. I couldn't tear my eyes from the edge of the clearing. And that's when I saw him. Standing on the far side of the trail, tall and lean, faded denim overalls hiding wiry strength. Dirt was stained under his nails, and what I later learned were blood flecks dotted his clothes. No way to see his face, the shadow from his worn baseball cap obscuring everything. My stomach clenched there was a wrongness about how he stood, watching, waiting. And he held, an axe. Voice caught in my throat, but Mom didn't hear me at first. Ranger truck pulled up, and her focus fell on that. I wanted to scream, but something primal told me silence was my only strategy. He stood there, the stillness chilling me to the bone. No sound, no motion— just that heavy presence lingering by the trail where the screams came from. Don't know how long passed. Dad came striding into view, and the figure disappeared with impossible speed into the undergrowth. I saw blood stains on his hands, the smear on his cheek. Ranger and Dad spoke quietly, voices too far to make out. But it didn't take a translator to understand the dread and tension thickening the air. That day, they found the couple, bodies torn open, throats slashed. We packed up in near silence, Mom holding Maya by the shoulder, an almost protective gesture. Dad's brow was creased, not from the effort of packing, but from worry. Nobody said it, 
but we all felt that there was something still lurking in those woods. They never caught whoever did that, some drifter, maybe some mountain survivalist gone wrong. And me? Part of me wants to say I dreamed the whole thing, the figure, the axe. Sometimes, under city street lights and surrounded by concrete and steel, it seems a world away. But my ankle bears the crooked twist from that fall, a reminder. And if, on a quiet night, the wind rustles just so, sometimes I hear those screams, and feel his eyes fixed upon me in the shadows. There's always a fleeting moment, right before your alarm blares for the day, where life is nothing but a serene dream. That sliver of peace was shattered the minute I set foot into the dense woods surrounding the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island, where I work. As a geneticist for the secretive government-funded initiative codenamed Project Leakin, my job was to tinker with genes most dare not touch. Among my colleagues was Zephyr Kreutzer, an odd man with a knack for virology, and Echo Yarwood, whose work on gene splicing had won a multitude of clandestine accolades. Communication in our facilities was always brisk, professional, and sprinkled with dark humor. If our test subjects ever got Tinder profiles, Echo mused, they'd swipe right and you'd wake up as a bat. Things shifted one serene evening when Zephyr failed to report to his station. As protocol dictated, I went looking for him. The lab was secure, but it's what lay outside that unsettled me. The sprawling woodlands seemed to envelop the silhouettes of night in a curtain of darkness. Logic dictated he wouldn't wander there without reason. It wasn't until I found his lab coat near an unauthorized access hatch that led to the forest perimeter did that gut-punch feeling hit. A silent alarm we all have for when things don't align with our understanding of the world. Armed with nothing but my keycard and an unsteady breath, I ventured outside. My flashlight cut swaths through the nocturnal symphony of rustling leaves and distant animal calls. The quietude felt oppressive, more so when I stumbled upon streams of blood leading towards an unknown destination within the woods. Now here's a simple joke. How do you track a bleeding scientist in pitch dark? You listen for the curses about his ruined white coat, or you find something far worse wearing it. To call what I saw, wildlife, would be sardonic even by my standards. It was as if childhood nightmares were born from local lore about beasts lurking in deep woods and given flesh, an unholy amalgamation of man and beast coated in karma and satire. My skepticism wrestled with raw terror when its gaze locked onto me. Every rational particle of my being wanted to call it a bear, a distorted mirage. But I knew bears didn't move with such deliberate malice or have eyes that flickered with human intelligence. In a moment all too vivid yet surreal, it charged, and instinct took over. My firearm, an indulgence equally shunned in scientific circles as it was necessary given our work, came to life in my hands like an omen I'd yet to understand. Echo's words from days past taunted me now. Our creations can always tell their maker. Was this creature chasing me another result of science marched grimly forward without ethics? Clarity was scarce as its growls choreographed a horrifying dance amongst twisted trees while bullets matched its steps. More than once it swiped at me, a warning each time. It wanted not just my life but whatever semblance of reality I clung to. My escape became primal maneuvering, ducking under clawed arms covering ground etched in deathly intent. Between desperate calls broadcast on our secure calms begging for backup and gasping pleas for survival lay an uncomfortable truth. Help wasn't coming because they couldn't hear or refuse to believe. The chase broke into a cleaving silence only dread could whisper over. 
history was replete with creatures part myth, part revelation. In this shadow-drenched chase through labyrinthine wilderness lay cold implications beneath every momentary reprieve from violent pursuit. A glimpse at my watch revealed hours had passed or maybe just seconds. Time distorted when chased by fables wrought real, a mockery of humanity's reign over nature. Lungs burning fiercely against cool night air could not douse the heat within as unanswered questions propelled my flight deeper within brush and bramble, an elusive safety seemingly always one step ahead. Each labored breath drew sharp contrasts between cultivated control within laboratory walls and wildness personified hunting doggedly at my heels. The potential end weighing heavily like Zephyr's abandoned white coat heavy with crimson expressionism mocking in gruesome artistry. I pressed on, the thorns lashing my face and arms with each desperate step. I clutched my side where the creature had caught me, warm witness telling tales of a wound deeper than I dared to inspect. It would have to wait. Ahead, moonlight seemed to reach for me through the dark canopy promising thinner forest and possibly a road. I should have called for help when I first heard that dreadful sound behind me. But in the fog of panic and disbelief, the concept of reaching out slipped away like sand through fingers. The radios we carried became decorative at best, the static humming a useless lullaby against this living nightmare's roar. The sound came again, a guttural snarl that seized my attention will power the only shield against its chilling effects. I glanced back. Two eyes gleamed like coals at dusk. Its shape was hulking, a dark silhouette mercifully not yet fully defined by my terror-stricken gaze. Its forelimbs were disproportioned in length, built for reaching rather than running, and ended in claws that tore up earth with each unchecked swipe. Skin glistened as though coated in some filmy mucus, catching errant rays that filtered through the trees. Another growl, close enough to feel vibrations underfoot. This wasn't the time for thought or heroics. This was raw instinct about survival. I broke into a clearing and glimpsed roofs. A welcome sign of civilization, maybe safety. Lights painted feeble hopes across my mind's canvas as I stumbled toward the possibility of refuge. The chase continued down narrow alleys, me always just ahead of malevolent intent manifesting in destructive pursuit. Houses lined my path but stood lifeless. Had they heard and barricaded themselves against this horror? Or was it just too late? Near collapse from exertion and blood loss, I reached a town square where lights shone brightest, perhaps hope personified in these darkest of moments. The creature lunged one last time but collided with something unforeseen. A car had swerved into its path. Metal clashed with flesh, an ugly symphony heralding momentary reprieve as the creature reeled from impact against something more tangible than fear or flight. People emerged then, Voices rose to assemble reality from nightmare shards. Bystanders turned rescuers moved toward me while others faced down the now-grounded terror with tools turned weapons. Wade! Over here! Called out a familiar voice. A colleague missing from our expedition team returned from seeking help upon realizing we were overdue. Emergency services swarmed soon after crawling over one another to attend to wounds or quell lingering alarms stirred by surreal events. In hospital linen later, authorities questioned me between gentle prods at memory's tender spots trying to paint veracity on an unbelievable canvas, a creature they could not classify terrorizing their quiet existence. They never found it despite searches that went on for days after. Only evidence remained— the torn metal carcass of a car and copious trails of dark ichor leading back to whatever abyss birthed it into our world. We gathered once more as a team some days later, even those injured insisted on attending this strange wake of sorts for normalcy turned fiction by force unheard till now. 
speculation spun wild as tired minds tried reason but ultimately found none. This beast wore no label science could claim nor lay trodden paths folklore might whisper tales about. Just cold fact and form indescribable now forever etched into each survivor's tale recounting abject horror faced and somehow overcome despite logic's protest display. I always figured life on the road would be filled with interesting tales, but nothing prepared me for what happened on that deserted stretch near Broken Bow, Nebraska. My name is Clayton Harjo. I've been driving rigs across the states for 15 years a decent life, seeing the country through a windshield. That day began just as mundane as any other. The hum of my truck was the only company I had or needed, hauling a full load destined for an out-of-the-way warehouse. Everything was routine until I took that rarely used shortcut and noticed a car abandoned awkwardly to the side of the dirt track, driver's door a gecky. Curiosity got the better of me, so I pulled up behind it to check things out. The car seemed hastily left, with keys still dangling from the ignition and a cell phone dropped on the driver's seat. Its screen cracked, splashed with something dark. I called out but got no answer. I should have turned back then but decided to investigate further, thinking someone might need help. Through dense rows of corn that flanked both sides of the road marched a somber procession, footprints leading away from the vehicle. Following them wasn't just about being thorough. It felt necessary. They led me to a decrepit barn looming in isolation amidst an ocean of green stalks. The doors creaked at my touch, revealing an interior laced with cobwebs and shrouded in shadows. A grisly sight unfolded before me, photos plastered all over with glaring red X's over people's faces, some who looked startlingly like ordinary folks I could pass on any sidewalk. Out of nowhere, he appeared. A man is part of the shadows themselves, tall and dressed in muted clothing with hands roughened from labor or something worse. His eyes were cold and calculating while a crooked smile crept across his face. He didn't say a word. His very presence spoke volumes of unnerving intent. Questions stormed my mind. Who was he? What happened here? Was he responsible for that abandoned car? The dread within me mounted as he edged closer. There was nowhere to run. Every exit seemed suddenly too far away. My only chance was distraction. Feigning ignorance might offer an escape. Beautiful land you've got here, I said casually, trying to sound unbothered while easing toward where I hoped salvation lay, back through those barn doors. He didn't react to my words. Instead, he moved with deliberate slowness, forcing me to maintain this macabre dance between prey and hunter. The light grew dimmer as if conspiring with him. Each blink felt like it might be my last view of this world. Panic set in when I realized there was no one else for miles who could hear or come to my aid no passing cars on this forgotten road save mine. My phone left charging in the cabin of my truck now seemed foolishly far away. This oversight wasn't due merely to complacency but rather confidence in routine, a confidence swiftly proving unfounded. We were alone, just him, me, and whatever sinister endgame played in his mind. A disturbing tableau began to unfold around us amidst bones scattered like grotesque confetti and dark stains painting tales of horror upon wood and earth. Each careful step back towards salvation was matched by his advance. A mirroring dance distilled in sheer terror yet cloaked under veils of normality's facade as though we were but two old friends discussing crops or weather rather than enacting an impromptu life-and-death waltz. In these fleeting moments, fatalistic humor found its way into my thoughts. Guess you could call this standoffish. 
escaped as a nervous chuckle more for myself than for any hope of camaraderie or diffusing tension within this derelict barn's ominous confines. In a desperate move, I dashed for the truck, but he was faster. His bulk barred my escape, his eyes intent and cold. There was no sense trying to overpower him. I needed another plan. With no phone at hand, my chances of calling for help were none. The realization hit me hard. It was survival, or it was over. He lunged forward, grabbing my arm with a vice-like grip. His nails dug deep, drawing blood. His breath was harsh against my face, but he remained silent, his intentions clear through the violence of his actions. I wrenched free, more by luck than strength, and scrambled towards the back of the barn where I caught sight of an old pitchfork resting against the wall. I seized it in a shaky grip, not as a weapon but a tool to buy more time. There was an opening, high up in the loft, too far to reach. But perhaps I could climb. I thrust the pitchfork between barn board and bale and hoisted myself up, pain searing through the wounds in my arm. From below came sounds of pursuit, his heavy footsteps and ragged breaths denoting an unstoppable force bent on catching its prey. I made it halfway up when a board gave way underfoot. Hanging by one arm, Staler rushed past as he tried to yank me down. With a desperate kick I freed myself from his grasp and continued upward. The loft was dark, suffocating, but it offered a momentary respite. From this vantage point I could see him clearly now, thick-set build, older than expected with weathered skin and dark hair matted with sweat. These few seconds allowed me to take stock, no way out but through him, and fight wasn't an option. My eyes scanned for alternatives. Then I saw it, barely perceivable in the dim light, an old ventilation window leading outside. Without hesitation I moved towards it. He followed beneath like a shadow mirroring my movements until I swung my legs out into open air and onto feeble footing. There was no going back now. Either I would make it or fall trying. I lowered myself down as quietly as possible just as his hands reached over the edge in search of me one last time. Then came sounds that would haunt anyone a crunch of bone echoing through empty space as he fell back inside onto hard ground below. I didn't stop to look down or contemplate what had just happened. Survival fueled every movement until at last my feet hit solid earth outside the barn. Pain flared in every limb but adrenaline pushed me forward towards my truck where salvation lay in ignition and gas pedal. Driving away from that place... My mind couldn't shake off the image of him lying motionless where he fell. It wasn't intentional, self-defense brought about by circumstances dire beyond imagination. At home safely days later after giving statements to concerned authorities who made their grim discoveries at that aged barn site, one fact gnawed at me. Hidden inside the man's pocket was an ID that bore the name Carter Hayes a man missing for years from these parts according to town talk post-incident cleanup. Those scattered bones belonged to others not fortunate enough to tell their tale as I did now into recorders or over hushed conversations. Some called what happened fate, call it survival instead, instinct honed by terror manifesting in actions born of sheer necessity when faced with raw danger incarnate. I remember it like it was yesterday. My name is Nolan Keswick. I work as a park ranger at the Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. That morning, the air was brisk, and the trees whispered secrets in the wind as I made my rounds through the dense mazes of greenery. I always start with a perimeter sweep to ensure no overnight campers stayed past their permits, routine yet necessary for park safety. As I walked, 
I noticed the backpack hung from a branch on a remote trail off the beaten path. Odd because it looked fairly new, not weather-worn like forgotten gear typically does. Inside were personal effects, a journal with handwriting that filled pages haphazardly and a name. Felix Harrogate, inscribed inside the cover. I radioed back to base to check if anyone by that name was registered at the campsite but received no answer. A flickering connection at best due to my location deep within the park's interior. I assumed dead spots in there, nothing unheard of but inconvenient nonetheless. Something in me whispered that this was not just another lost item report. The journal's last entry abruptly stopped mid-sentence, ending with, It's watching me from. The silence of Mammoth Cave can be profound, the kind that envelopes you and squeezes till your own breath becomes an intruder. It calls to mind how insignificant one person could be, eclipsed by ancient caverns. That's when I saw markings on nearby trees, not signs or symbols but deep scratches, calculated and uniform in height, roughly seven feet off the ground. Human hands don't reach so high without help. Later as dusk approached, hikers reported cries from deeper trails normally I'd pass it off as wildlife. It's their domain after all. But combined with Felix's things I couldn't shrug off responsibility. With my firearms secured and flashlight piercing darkness ahead, I ventured where most light shied away from entering. Stalactites presented themselves like dagger teeth against my light. Underneath, the earth breathed cooler than surface air. Then movement darted at the edges of vision, not seen but felt, the periphery dance of something adept at avoiding direct sight. My boots threatened to crunch too loudly against fallen leaves as if even nature rebelled against silence's break. Ahead lay remnants of clothing and gear strewn with intention across a narrow path. No animal does this, leading towards an unexplored cave mouth hidden by weeping willows kissed by time's passage. Gathering my thoughts and checking for any reason for gunfire was valid. My fingers brushed cold metal willing action if needed. Nothing in training prepares you for unexplained phenomena. Reality rarely entertains such notions until thrust upon you. A growl emanated deeper within, a primal sound, and I met eyes that reflected no light back but drank it greedily instead. A creature rose, tall beyond reason or humanity's domain. Its features were a medley of nightmare conjuring scratched into existence, a grotesque parody of evolution left unchecked. Felix Harrogate's cries now sounded like distant memories carried on winds fleeing horrors yet unseen, and then silence again stood monolithic save for that creature's ragged breaths matching mine. Pressing forward meant confronting unknown science had yet to educate me on. Retreating meant abandoning potential survivors to fate's authors dare only write of. Adrenaline claimed supremacy over logic, giving haste to limbs demanding either flight or fight. I turned, instinct pushing me towards escape. The creature stalked from the shadows, towering and fierce. Distorted limbs ended in claws that etched grooves into the earth. Its eyes were caverns, filled with a darkness deeper than the surrounding night. I didn't know this creature, nor did I care to learn. My mission shifted from investigation to survival. With each breath, a decision, run and live, maybe save others. There was no question of fighting, not against this being of raw power and apparent malice. The radio at my hip offered a lifeline, but as I grasped it, the creature lunged with a snarl that paralyzed action. Communication meant noise, inviting death. Silent now, I slid the radio back. It came closer, a predator secure in its dominion over prey. Talons clicked in erratic rhythm, heralding ruin, flesh rent from bone in anticipation of the inevitable. My job as an explorer of unknown terrains was not to become part of them. Not like this. 
The creature tilted its head as though amused by my stillness, reveling in the hunt before descent. A snap to my left, a branch underfoot or comrade unseen? The creature recoiled with an otherworldly hiss and shifted its ominous focus. Escaping seemed possible now. I broke into run, a sprint fueled by sheer will more than hope or courage. Through forest thick and unforgiving, branches clawed at my uniform like the echo of the horror that pursued me, and it did pursue. Leaves rustled violently behind me. It was close. Every ounce of tuition screamed to turn neither left nor right but forward, towards base camp lights that seemed impossibly distant yet undeniably there. My flight ended with a burst through underbrush into open space where others worked unaware of horrors mere yards away. Urgent words burst from my lips, a warning without clarity. They understood enough. Evacuation ensued as orders barked crisp and sharp cut through confusion. We left equipment behind. The price for life is sometimes measured in gear and unanswered questions. The creature didn't breach camp borders though shouts and shouts rang empty. Days folded into one another after the incident. Inquiries hung unanswered as we nursed silent trauma and counted blessings masqueraded as luck or timing. In memory they remain, victims carried off into legends we refused to utter, a colleague named Felix whose laughter now echoes in mind more than ears, whose fate we can only infer with grim certainty, transforming into tales told with tight throats and looks askance. Closure is myth when understanding fails us. Some answers lie buried beneath earth cooler than surface air. We leave them there where horror lurks on periphery placed just out of sight but forever sensed omnipresent when darkness falls once more on quiet pathways where we no longer tread. The cottony clouds of twilight draped over the Shasta Trinity National Forest were serene so deceptive against the pandemonium brewing within. As a fire lookout stationed at the post-mountain lookout tower, I'd expected isolation and perhaps the occasional rush of nature's fury. But the barbarity I witnessed that dusk was either natural nor explainable. My name is Eamon Keane, a recluse who finds solace in the wilderness. What started as a seasonal job to stay clear of urban monotony soon became my existential cocoon. Stories from veterans resonate over the crackling radios, but nothing prepared me for that July evening when a mutilated deer, eviscerated as if by savage machinery, was my wake-up call to an unseen nightmare. The following days wasted no sunlight. Intermittent sounds of disturbed brush intruded upon the daylight hours. Briefly glimpsing an abject figure whose silhouette managed not to retain any form and memory intensified my trepidation. It wasn't any creature known to these woods or the almanac of fauna. Its movements embodied malice, deliberate yet phantom-like amidst the pines and redwoods. Deliberations with locals had painted me as Calanthe an oddity bearing an uncommon name for an equally odd profession. The nearest semblance of human interaction was through teeny radio channels with fellow lookouts like Tavish at Bald Mountain and Soline in Big Bear. Their voices, customary yet distant, did little to allay my growing anxiety. Events escalated when Tavish failed to make his routine report one morning. Uncertain whispers developed into a chilling silence on his end over subsequent days. Speculations ranged from injury to absconding, but a gut-wrenching scream snatched through our radios one midnight left each one of us cold. Was it animalistic fury or human anguish? I remember scouring through my binoculars that night, seeking signs below when something unnervingly upright traipsed across my line of sight momentarily before melding back into darkness. Capitalizing on this visual breach meant descending towards potential peril, 
but rational thoughts had been replaced by a palpable drive to confront this elusive terror. Tramping through undergrowth with only my headlamp casting feeble lights ahead seemed foolish now, but fear had transformed into something more potent. Resolve. Damp bark under my palms and needled floor underfoot framed this nightmarish hike to where Tavish last broadcasted from. As I approached Bald Mountain's base, an abrupt cessation of nocturnal life left me adrift in ear-piercing silence. Then came the laugh, no ordinary chuckle but one devoid of joy or warmth, floating across the timberland with macabre tenor enough to stifle breaths and smother hearts. There it stood partly enshrouded by moonlight's caress, its form obstructed by fluttering leaves yet unmistakable now in proximity bipedal grotesqueness juxtaposed against nature's design. And as it stepped toward me with intent etched into its every movement, I felt the peculiar sensation of humor tickling through the terror. What better cosmic joke than to find such absurdity here in creation's art? I stumbled back as the creature advanced. It towered, its limbs disproportionately long, fingers ending in claws. The skin glinted under the strained moonbeams, like leather stretched over too much bone, and its eyes were hollows, black pits reflecting a malicious intent. It had no mouth that I could see, but its face contorted as if taunting me silently. I turned and fled, my breath quick and sharp, my heart a drumbeat in my chest. Run that was all I could do. Behind me, branches snapped heavy footfalls gaining as the creature pursued with unnatural speed. I couldn't call out. The thick forest would muffle any attempt to attract help and my radio lay forgotten by Bald Mountain's base. Approaching a cliff edge, I skidded to a halt, the beast behind me. It swiped with vicious accuracy, catching my back and sending me sprawling to the ground. Fumbling for support, my hand brushed something metallic Tavish's dropped radio. With little hope it would function after days out here, I pressed it to my lips and pleaded into it for a rescue team. But the beast leapt before I could hear a response. It grasped and threw me aside with ease, cracking my ribs on hitting the ground hard. Pain seared through me as I heard others approach, not one set of footsteps but many. The creature turned its head at their arrival. Those who came were not just fellow rangers but armed forces alerted by Tavish's prior transmissions. As they fired upon the beast, its cries tore through the night before it retreated back into the forest depths. Rescue teams later found remnants strewn across an area, patchy fur laced with human blood, large footprints not matching any known species in databases. The truth hit us hard. We were dealing with an unknown predator. We honored Tavish and those lost before him with a vigil at Bald Mountain's base. Brave souls who'd encountered this mystery firsthand before us. Weeks passed without another sighting or attack. Whispers arose suggesting it had moved on or succumbed to injuries from that night. Whatever resided in those woods became a somber legend among rangers a cautionary tale of respect toward nature's unexplained aspects and an homage to those who end up facing them head-on unknowingly. And so we patrol relentlessly now with knowledge sharp as thorns worry of what hides beyond our understanding but determined never to forget those who stand vigilant against the night's dark veil. I woke up feeling uneasy, like my gut was trying to signal something. My name is Neil Harrington, a decent guy with a steady job at a local hardware store in Des Moines, Iowa. Life had been average lately, nothing out of the ordinary happening around me. At work, my friend Brad Bannon asked about a side gig as a security guard at a museum exhibition. Though I'm no expert on prehistoric reptiles, it sounded interesting enough. As the sun set after the long day, 
I strolled to the museum, ready to take on my new role. My shift began at 5 p.m. sharp. The museum seemed silent and deserted now that all the staff and visitors were gone. The only sounds came from the echo of doors creaking open and distant footsteps. I started patrolling corridors filled with relics of the past. As I walked down one hall, something caught my eye. There was an oddly shaped shadow near one of the exhibits. With haste I shined my flashlight on it, revealing Dale Hillman, our janitor, dumping some trash bags. Hey Dale! You scared me for a second. He chuckled and replied with his thick southern drawl intertwined with an amusing quip about abandoning ship if he were in a horror film. A week into my nocturnal assignment, things took a peculiar turn when some co-workers began complaining of strange occurrences during their shifts. They mentioned hearing inexplicable noises and disturbing whispers. That night, as I roamed through the dark halls lined with ancient fossils encased in glass cages, it happened. I stumbled upon an open cage door housing an old reptilian artifact. Feeling unease churning in my stomach again, I closed the cage door and continued my route. Time seemed to stutter when suddenly objects around the exhibition started shifting and rattling unnervingly like there was an intruder meddling with them. Radioing for backup, I stood my ground waiting for someone to show up. As the minutes crawled by and tension heightened, my colleague Jessica arrived breathless holding a small handgun. She'd grabbed it from the security office, or so she claimed. Nervously gripping our weapons, we fought to decipher what was happening. Did someone break in? Was this some supernatural phenomenon? The truth either of us could fathom. Then out of nowhere, a repulsive stench filled the air. The scent could only be compared to decaying flesh, assaulting our nostrils. Jessica gagged. I held my breath as we pressed on. Soon something monstrous loomed in the dim light ahead. The creature was tall and scaly, with slimy green skin and razor-sharp teeth housed in its elongated reptilian head. Bewildered and horrified, we could hardly believe or comprehend what lay before our very eyes. It became clear this couldn't be human nor ancient artifact come to life. A guttural growl emanated from its body, sending shivers up both our spines. With no time for disbelief or speculation, nor dialing 911, Jessica fired at the creature's torso while screaming for help. A cacophony of gunshots echoed through the museum halls as eldritch-looking fluid spilled from its wounds. The thing retreated momentarily but quickly retaliated with unnerving agility as it came back at full force. Though it was fast, Jessica managed to dodge a few strikes from those perilous claws while reloading her gun. She fired another round as bits of the reptilian invader came off each time her shot found its mark. As the creature continued to attack, I couldn't help but think that we needed more assistance. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. The operator picked up just as Jessica fired another round at the creature. 911, what's your emergency? The operator asked. We're at the museum, and there's a dangerous creature attacking us. We need police here now. I yelled over the sounds of gunfire. The operator assured me that help was on its way. Jessica and I continued to fight off the attacker backing away through the museum as it advanced towards us. Its scales shimmered in the dim light of the corridor, and every time Jessica landed a hit, a sickening explosion of dark fluid erupted from its injury. Backup arrived in what felt like an eternity, but was likely only five minutes at most. As the officers charged into the building, we shouted for them to be careful giving what information we could about our attacker, but it was hard to describe without sounding insane. Nonetheless, they took our warning seriously. In a matter of moments, 
the officers had taken positions around the creature. Shots rang through the air as they fired upon it with their weapons. The reptilian assailant screeched out in pain but persisted in its relentless attacks, lashing its tail angrily against anything within reach. It didn't take long for one of these furious movements to impact an officer with full force, sending him flying across the room and crashing into a display case. Our hearts sank as we realized he would not be standing again. More officers arrived on scene, wielding higher-grade weapons, and began shooting at the creature once more. This display of force seemed to have an effect as its movements became less precise. It stumbled and screeched loudly in pain as it tried to get away from these new threats. Suddenly there was a blinding flash of light while one of our saviors launched something at it. The creature roared in agony and fell to the ground, unmoving. Jessica and I stared at it in shock, hardly believing that this nightmare could be over so quickly. Paramedics arrived not long after the skirmish ended. They immediately assisted the injured, though there was nothing they could do for the unfortunate officer killed by the beast. We shared our experience with investigators from a safe distance as they carefully examined the corpse of the slain antagonist. Over the next few days, we had several interviews with officials. It became clear that no one knew where the creature truly came from or what it was, though rumors began to circulate about some sort of undiscovered alien species. These theories were never substantiated by any proof but were enough to raise intrigue among many. A week after that nightmarish ordeal, we attended a ceremony honoring the fallen officer. There were somber eulogies and heartfelt speeches, all paying respects to someone who had died in such an unjust and bizarre way. The experience changed our lives drastically, leaving us questioning everything we previously thought we had known about reality. But one thing couldn't be denied. We had survived. And as we stood together at that memorial, vowing never to forget what had happened or those who lost their lives while defending us, we knew that somehow we would find a way to move forward and continue living. Because if nothing else was certain in this strange new world of ours, at least we still had each other. And perhaps in times like these, when remnants of ordinary days seemed unthinkable, that was all we really needed. I stumbled upon an isolated cabin in a dense forest just as the sun was setting. My name is Raylan Mendez, and I'm on a well-deserved vacation after an exhausting few months at work. Living in a bustling city, I welcomed this peaceful retreat, and it had been several days since I last saw another soul. As the night approached, I huddled up next to a crackling fire in the living room. On my way to bed, I noticed something peculiar in the distance outside one of the windows, unusual footprints that didn't seem quite human. Could be just another animal, I shrugged. Tiredness took over, and I laid down drifting off into a deep sleep. A loud crack outside woke me up with a jolt. A branch had fallen. Or so it seemed. When daylight came, my curiosity led me to follow the footprints from last night. They ended abruptly at a small hidden cave, crouching low. I peeked inside only to find discarded clothing stained with blood. A chill ran down my spine. It was just like my brother's case. He vanished six months ago without a trace, leaving behind his blood-stained clothes. Vowing to find out what happened, I retreated back to the cabin to gather supplies. I armed myself with my father's old shotgun and packed extra rounds so that I wouldn't be caught off guard by any threats of wildlife. I ventured back to the cave as darkness fell, cautiously crept inside and with each step forward shadows grew darker, until I suddenly found myself face to face with a horrific sight. 
mangled limbs scattered across the ground belonging to dozens of humans left unidentifiable due to evisceration. In that dread-filled moment, movement drew my attention to the mouth of the cave. It entered, grotesque and unlike any creature seen before, large in size standing upright on muscular legs bearing razor-sharp claws where feet should be, its chest heaving furiously like some lumbering beast. The moonlight bathed upon it exposed sickly green skin covered in spines and scales running across its enormous back. Serpent-like eyes shone within sockets they held no humanity. Facing that abomination, I froze for seconds that felt like hours. Snapping into action, I aimed the shotgun at the creature and fired. Click, nothing. My heart pounding. A grim chuckle escaped at the fatal oversight. I never loaded the weapon. The creature swiped a colossal arm through the air. I dove out of harm's way just in time. I needed to reload, now. Sprinting out of the cave entrance as fast as my legs could carry me, I dared not look back. All of a sudden, a guttural shriek rang through the eerie silence like a searing razor assailing my eardrums. It began pursuing. As adrenaline surged through my veins, leaves crunching underfoot ignited by terror-filled momentum, I rushed towards the cabin in an attempt to seek refuge. Finally reaching its door, with shaking hands and panting breaths from pure exertion, fumbling with keys to unlock safety, my shaky hands did their best she could feel the presence behind me growing closer. Taking cover within this ramshackle sanctuary, it would provide but little comfort under assault. The creature just outside, fury incarnate momentarily restrained only by brittle wood standing between us. My father's shotgun finally loaded, death hanging heavy in each chamber. I had no other choice. Survival hinged on a reckoning that approached with each thundering pound against the barricade which was breaking apart violently time seemed fleeting. The pounding on the wooden door grew louder, sending splinters onto the cabin floor. My hands tremored as I tightened my grip on the shotgun. For fleeting moments, I was overcome by pure survival instinct. Any thoughts of outside assistance vanished. My father's voice echoed in my mind, reminding me to keep calm under extreme pressure. With that thought, I realized I hadn't even tried calling for help. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my cell phone, only to find it had been crushed during the chase. My shattered phone served as a poignant reminder of the futility of my situation, and it forced me to focus on the task at hand, facing this creature alone. Suddenly, a resounding crash indicated that the door had finally given way under the sheer force of the creature. The gigantic figure stepped towards me, its massive arms swinging threateningly. It stood at least eight feet tall with thick matted fur covering its muscular body. The creature's eyes were black, lifeless orbs that offered no hint of mercy or understanding. As it approached... I noticed a long series of scarring along its left flank, evidence of past confrontations with other unfortunate victims. Yet here it stood before me, victorious and unfazed by previous encounters. I steeled myself and took aim again at the beast. This time there would be no mistake the shotgun was loaded and ready to fire. As it advanced, without warning or fear, I pulled the trigger twice. The deafening sound of gunfire erupted in the small cabin as Buckshot tore through the air towards the monstrous assailant. It didn't flinch, but arched painfully backwards from the impact. Not waiting for it to recover, I scrambled towards a window at the back of the cabin and managed to squeeze through just as the creature lunged for me with its enormous arms. Trapped momentarily by its size, it roared in frustration as I stumbled into the forest beyond. Panicking, I realized I hadn't a plan beyond fleeing and that I was lost. My head throbbed with every footstep. Exhaustion threatened to overtake me. 
but giving in to fatigue would result in certain death. I couldn't outrun this creature forever. Suddenly, as if guided by providence, I spotted my truck at the edge of the woods, a chance for escape. With every ounce of energy left, I sprinted towards it, flung the door open, climbed inside, and started the engine. My hands slammed the gear shift into drive and slammed on the gas pedal. Just as my tires bit into the dirt, the creature emerged from the trees looming like a nightmarish specter. But it wasn't fast enough. The truck gained speed, and soon the horrifying figure faded into distance. Overwhelmed by my narrow escape, I made my way to a nearby town in search of medical attention and to inform local authorities about what had transpired. Predictably, they questioned both my story and my sobriety. The fact that there were no witnesses or proof of the encounter didn't help make my tale any easier to swallow. However, as I described in great detail what had transpired, an older police officer listened intently. After explaining that rumors of such an indomitable beast had persisted throughout generations albeit only whispered so not to incite panic he offered his sympathy and understanding. Son, he said somberly, the locals call it the Colossus, a legend heard only in hushed tones around these parts. The few who have encountered it never lived to tell their tale. Understanding washed over me like a wave of relief somehow making me feel less alone with what happened, giving reason to remain vigilant against the day when the Colossus might return for retribution. I'm Officer Reed Fitzgerald, working in the quiet town of Silvertown, Pennsylvania. I remember it was lunch break at the station when my younger colleague, Davis Conroy, tried to mimic my mustache, a poor attempt at humor, but it broke the ice. The bond between us grew stronger ever since. One day, we got dispatched to investigate a missing person named Delbert Quinton, an elderly man with a distinctive hooked nose and a hunched posture who had disappeared from his house without a trace. His worried wife had called us for help. We arrived at the Quinton residence and searched for clues. The only thing out of place was the tomato soup bubbling on the stove, as if Delbert had vanished mid-meal. Mrs. Quinton's face, creased with worry lines, desperately sought answers. I've contacted all our neighbors, but no one has seen him since this morning, she informed us anxiously. Davis and I canvassed the neighborhood but came up empty-handed. Our next move was to question Delbert's lifelong friend living on the edge of town, a fellow named Ira Higgins. As we approached Ira's house, we noticed scratch marks on his front door, as if someone or something had clawed at it aggressively. Those scratches are new, muttered Ira as he opened the door with suspicion etched on his face. After sharing Delbert's disappearance story with him, he looked genuinely concerned. I haven't seen him in days, said Ira while offering us some tea. We then noticed that even Ira's hand trembled slightly. Conversations with friends and family turned up no clue about Delbert's whereabouts. Weeks flew by without any sign of him. On a cold night, another call interrupted our investigation routine. Laura Himmelreich reported her husband missing after finding their bedroom window shattered and blood-stained curtains hanging by the jagged edge of broken glass. Davis and I raced to the scene, our urgency heightened by the chilling report. Laura, a petite woman with expressive eyes and dark brown hair, clung to their young daughter, both visibly frightened. We consoled and reassured them, then canvassed the entire house. Besides the shattered window, we also noticed footprints leading towards the dense woods behind their property. Grim determination set in as we geared up and ventured into the dark forest to find whatever it was that wreaked havoc in Silvertown. 
Strange noises and rustles accompanied our uneasy steps. Abandoned cabins and decaying structures revealed themselves among the trees, memories of a forgotten past concealed by shadows. A distant scream jerked us from our thoughts. We sprinted towards the sound, determined to save whoever or whatever was in danger. Each pounding footfall mirrored our racing hearts. Coming upon a forbidding clearing, we were dumbstruck by what we saw, a creature, humanoid with reptilian features, scales covering its entire body, and razor-sharp claws dripping with blood. It held the mauled lifeless body of Laura's husband. Davis raised his gun at the beast as it lunged forward toward us with unimaginable speed, its maw opening wide to reveal a cavernous throat filled with rows upon rows of serrated teeth that could easily bite us in half. I yelled at Davis, Shoot it! He fired off several rounds at the creature, each bullet making an unsettling thud as they pierced its scaly hide. To our disbelief, the beast hardly flinched and continued barreling towards us. Regaining my composure, I yelled toward Laura's house. Laura! Call 911 right now! Tell them there's a dangerous animal attacking us! Time seemed to slow as we tried to fend off the monster's advances, hoping help would arrive soon. With no other choice, Davis and I retreated deeper into the woods while continuously firing our weapons at the creature with little effect. It was relentless. As we darted through the trees, we noticed the cave further in a temporary refuge, perhaps. We headed straight for it, narrowly avoiding branches that whipped back at us. Upon reaching the cave entrance, we hurriedly threw ourselves inside before slumping to the cold floor. Panting and exhausted from our flight, we could still hear those unnerving sounds coming closer. The blood-curdling roars echoed through the cave as if mocking our fruitless attempts to escape. We scrambled deeper into the darkness until we discovered a narrow crevice that seemed impenetrable by its sheer size alone. Quickly maneuvering ourselves inside, we had no choice but to wait. And so we did weapons in hand and nerves frayed. At long last, after what felt like an eternity of echoes being replaced by silence, Davis cautiously made his way out of the crevice, warily glancing around in all directions before signaling that it was safe for me to follow suit. It took several moments for our eyes to adjust to the gloom before realizing that help had finally arrived. A team of armed officers carefully approached us from outside the cave with their guns raised and ready. Their faces etched with disbelief upon seeing us alive amidst absolute mayhem. The body of Laura's husband was taken away, and paramedics tended to our minor injuries. Our superiors made a point to question us about exactly what had happened in those woods last night, and while we recounted the terrifying ordeal, we could sense their skepticism as the words left our lips. The creature had vanished as swiftly as it arrived, leaving nothing but a trail of destruction in its wake. Despite reinforcements scouring the area for any trace of it, no evidence was found to prove its existence or origin. I couldn't help but feel responsible for the death that night, for those shattered lives left behind in this tragedy. Whatever that creature was or wherever it came from must have been beyond us. The depths of the unknown are far more powerful and terrifying than anyone could comprehend. Laura had lost her husband that night, leaving her and their daughter to face life alone with only memories as cruel reminders of what transpired. As promised, Davis and I attended the funeral and walked alongside them on that solemn day each step heavier than the one before. Even years later, Silvertown seemed forever changed by those horrifying events. Whispers echoed through town with fingers pointing at researchers trying to unlock cryptic secrets around us secrets buried deep within our world never meant to be uncovered. 
Eventually, scars of another time faded into nothingness as Silvertown began its slow yet arduous healing process. In truth, I know we'll never find the creature again nor discern its origin one drenched in darkness wrapped in a veil of primordial cruelty unlike anything humanity has known. But I remain haunted by that fateful night when terror emerged from shadows with an unquenchable thirst for blood. I remember waking up that morning feeling excited, thinking it was going to be the perfect day for hunting. My name is Harrison Carmichael, a seasoned hunter who knew the landscape of the dense woods in West Virginia like the back of my hand. I quickly gathered my gear, which included my trusty rifle, and headed to the forest. As I entered the familiar West Virginia woods, a feeling of unease washed over me for some reason. Shaking it off, I began to track small game while keeping an eye out for larger prey. The forest was unusually quiet as if all animals had suddenly vanished or were hiding from something. The deeper I went into the woods, the more uneasy I became. Suddenly I stumbled upon a gruesome sight a pool of blood on the ground but no body attached to it. A trail of blood led deeper into the foliage. As any skeptical person would be, I cautiously decided to follow it despite my rising concern. As I continued through the forest, following the bloody trail underfoot, I noticed that tree branches were broken in odd ways and trampled bushes created a path that seemed unnatural. It became increasingly clear that something exceptional had happened here. No amount of hunting experience prepared me for what lay ahead. The bloody trail led to a small clearing where remains were scattered everywhere. Human bones picked clean, pools of what can only be described as congealed gore spattered around. My stomach turned as Bao rose at the back of my throat. Feeling exposed and vulnerable in this corpse-littered clearing, I began to pick up speed retreating from the scene but suddenly heard rustling behind me. Wheeling around with my rifle at the ready, I could make out a pair of glowing red eyes piercing through the gloom several feet away and peering straight into mine. The creature that stood before me was utterly terrifying, a tall monstrosity with coarse matted hair covering its lanky frame, long arms tipped with razor-sharp claws, and a gaunt wolf-like face bearing rows of serrated teeth. Paralyzed by this encounter with the unknown antagonist, my legs buckled beneath me, but my instincts refused to let me become another victim. It lunged at me and instinctively, I fired a shot. But to my horror, the bullet seemed to have no effect barely slowing down the creature's advance. It growled angrily in response and swiped its massive claws towards me. Narrowly dodging the attack, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for cover, trying to put distance between myself and the beast. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I continued to zigzag through the forest in hopes of evading it. However, the creature was relentless in its pursuit stalking, growling, snarling as we raced through the woods. All reason abandoned me in those moments. I knew I could not call for help as there was no time nor chance of a timely response in these isolated woods. My breath came in heaving gasps as exhaustion threatened to bring me down. In an attempt to take advantage of unfinished construction nearby, I dashed into a half-built hunting lodge before hurriedly clambering up toward an elevated vantage point. Crouching on an exposed rafter with my rifle aimed at the door below, I watched as the creature cautiously entered the structure sniffing right beneath my perch. My hands shook uncontrollably while aiming at its head, but before I squeezed the trigger, it vanished from sight leaving only darkness and silence behind. Cautiously, I climbed down from the rafter, barely allowing myself to breathe. I glanced around the dark hunting lodge, searching for any signs of the creature, 
but it seemed to have disappeared entirely. In that brief moment of silence, I grappled with the decision to call for help or continue alone. Knowing that my phone had little reception in these woods and help would take too long to arrive, I opted to look for some mode of transportation. There was an old dirt road not far from the construction site that led back to a nearby town. I moved quickly but quietly out of the hunting lodge, my eyes scanning the dense foliage for any sign of the creature's return. As I reached the road and began walking briskly towards town, an ear-piercing howl echoed through the air confirmation that it was indeed still pursuing me. My heart pounded fiercely as I picked up my pace, each step sending a fresh wave of fear-induced adrenaline coursing through my veins. The howls drew closer and closer until they were nearly deafening. Suddenly, a vehicle approached from behind at breakneck speed. The driver, an off-duty ranger named Bill, had seen my frantic movements and sensed something was wrong. He screeched to a halt beside me, yelling for me to get in. Heaving a sigh of relief but filled with urgency, I climbed into his truck and slammed the door shut just as the creature burst from the foliage. Bill floored the accelerator as our hands grappled with our seat belts simultaneously. The creature chased us down the road with incredible speed causing rips in soil from its massive claws. What is that thing? Bill yelled over the engine's roar but without waiting for a reply, he focused on driving us further from danger. Catching our breath as we finally seemed to lose sight of the beasts pursuing us, Bill noticed several deep scratches bleeding on my arm. Pulling over at a safe distance, he opened the glove compartment, revealing a hidden flask and first aid kit. After cleaning and dressing the wound, he handed me the flask of much-needed comfort and offered me a ride to the nearest police station. As we drove down the winding road back to town, I recounted my terrifying ordeal to Bill. He listened intently, eyes narrowed in confusion and alarm. Upon reaching the police station, we both gave our testimonies about the encounter. The officer seemed skeptical of our story but promised to send a team out to investigate the area. A few days later, I received an update on their findings deep claw marks were found at both the site of our encounter and the road where Bill had picked me up. Scattered animal carcasses, torn limbs, and teeth marks on bones indicated that something had indeed been hunting in those woods. However, no definitive conclusion could be established on the true nature of this creature. Rumors began to circulate about what stalked through those woods now known as the Gaunt Wolf. Searches continued for weeks without success. People started avoiding the area altogether while others remained fascinated by its existence. Though I'm far from being a folklore enthusiast or cryptozoologist fan, I cannot help but ponder just what that creature was. A mutation? An escaped experimental subject? The answer remained elusive. In time, I moved away from that town, but not without sharing one critical piece of advice with those who remained, never venture into those woods alone or without protection. Death could come swiftly from behind serrated teeth and elongated claws. That creature left me both physically and emotionally scarred a constant reminder that there are still mysteries in this world waiting just beyond the veil of human understanding. It all started with a casual chat during our break at the bookstore where I worked. My co-worker, Regina Lofton, mentioned her camping trip to Crater Lake National Park. I had recently gone through a rough breakup and wanted something to clear my head. Would you like some company? I asked. She agreed, and soon we were off on our adventure. Regina drove us into the park in her beat-up pickup truck. She wore her long, blonde hair in a ponytail, revealing her fair skin covered in freckles. 
We bantered about our shared love for books and her aspirations as an artist before she asked about my life. I mentioned that I was recently single after my partner cheated on me and was looking for an escape, anything to snap me out of my misery. We set up camp near Wizard Island within the caldera of Mount Mazama. Regina told me how the park had formed thousands of years ago when a volcanic eruption collapsed the summit of Mount Mazama, creating Crater Lake, which filled with rainwater and melted snow. As the sun sank behind the rim of the caldera, we cooked a meal together and enjoyed it under the starry sky. The natural beauty around us offered a much-needed reprieve from the stresses of life. The calm did not last long. We awoke to screams, puncturing through our peaceful sleep. We scrambled out of our tents to find another group of campers huddling together in panic. One man spoke through tears. Helen, she's gone. Scratch marks were found near Helen's tent but no footprints or signs of struggle. It seemed as if she had vanished into thin air. Bewildered by this event but determined not to be scared off by an isolated incident, we convinced ourselves it was an unfortunate accident or tragic prank and carried on with our plans. We hiked around trails and admired the azure waters of Crater Lake, trying to shake off the unease. When we returned to camp, however, we found another panicked camper, her face etched in terror. My brother, he's missing, she stammered. We spotted something by the water, an animal, but it was too fast. Park rangers were called in, but with no luck at finding Helen or the second missing camper. They insisted there were no large predators in the area, but warned us to be vigilant and stick together. As an uneasy quiet settled over the campground, we huddled around a campfire. Regina whispered that she had last seen Helen by the water's edge taking photographs when her flashlight illuminated something strange on a nearby rock, a grayish mass that was hard to identify. Fear squeezed our chests as we heard noises in the darkness surrounding our campsite. Imaginations raced wild with dread, but we persisted in our false sense of safety. During what should have been a peaceful day exploring the shores of Crater Lake, another scream echoed across the water. This time it was accompanied by a guttural snarl, something predatory and unmistakably non-human. Our eyes widened as we spotted a massive creature near one of our fellow campers, its bulky form covered in barnacle-like protrusions with claws sharp enough to rend flesh. It let out another ear-spiercing screech before dragging its prey into the forest. We fled back to camp only to find it ransacked, more people missing. The rangers were called again composing search parties for both the lost campers and this unidentified creature. Regina and I gathered up what was left of our belongings and prepared to leave, wanting nothing more than to be away from this nightmare. We locked ourselves in her truck, hearts pounding as we listened for any sign of that horrifying monster which stalked us from the shadows. Just as we began to drive away, the creature emerged from the undergrowth. It leapt towards the truck, its claws sliding across the hood. I shouted and Regina slammed on the gas pedal, sending the engine roaring to life. We barreled down the dirt road while listening for any sign that the creature was following us. The anticipation of the next encounter with this deadly predator was too much for us to bear. As hopefulness faded under our rising dread, we heard something crashing through the foliage, coming closer. Panic set in as we continued driving, our bodies tensed and our ears tuned to every sound around us. We decided to call for help and contacted the local police, explaining the terrifying encounter we had just experienced. They acknowledged our report but seemed skeptical, most likely assuming it was a wild animal or some sort of prank. We couldn't wait for potentially unreliable help anymore, so we hurriedly devised an escape plan. 
Regina and I agreed that reaching the nearest town would be our best chance of survival. We focused on putting as much distance between us and the creature as possible while keeping an eye out for any sign of it following us. The forest thinned as we drove further away from Crater Lake. We noticed the sky darkening and realized night was approaching, a time when the creature might be even more active and dangerous. This possibility made us desperate to find safety before the darkness took over. As we entered the outskirts of a small town, Regina slammed on the brakes. In front of us lay a gruesome sight. Several mutilated bodies lay scattered across the road, limbs torn apart by something with tremendous force. It became apparent that we were not the only victims of this monstrous creature. Feeling vulnerable, we turned off the vehicle's headlights, hoping to remain unseen by our pursuer. With caution, we slowly navigated through the horrifying scene before finally reaching the town center. We spotted a motel and decided to seek refuge there for the night. Inside, several other people huddled together, their faces showing terror and shock from encountering similar nightmares. Nobody dared speak about their experiences, but exchanged knowing glances that they were not alone in their fear. Throughout the night, distant screams and terrible noises filled our ears while we helplessly watched through windows and prayed for our lives. Many of us chose not to sleep that night in case we ended up waking up too late or couldn't escape should danger approach. As dawn approached, the town woke up, with people going about their business, seemingly unfazed by the horror that lurked around them. Regina and I couldn't understand why they seemed so unaffected by the horrors surrounding us. We mustered the courage to ask one of the locals if they knew anything about the monster we encountered at Crater Lake. The man looked at both of us with genuine concern before he spoke. You probably came face to face with what we assume is a kappa, he said hesitantly. It's a dangerous mythical creature that lives in rivers and lakes, fiercely aggressive. It's known to attack humans, animals, basically anything that crosses its path. The fact that we had just survived an encounter with a creature of folklore was incomprehensible, but the evidence was undeniable. We realized it was pointless to question further if others had also accepted this monster's existence. In the end, Regina and I decided it would be best for our safety to leave town and return to our normal lives. We said goodbye to those who'd shared our nightmarish ordeal and left. The memory of that horrifying experience still haunts me to this day. The faces of those whose lives were taken by the beast weigh heavily on my conscience. I remain forever grateful for our miraculous escape from death. As a reminder of how fragile life can be, I hold on to a single barnacle-like protrusion ripped from the creature during our struggle. This grotesque artifact is now my keepsake, a symbol of untamable fear and an acknowledgement of just how vulnerable we are in the face of such unknown horrors lurking behind every corner. I remember the day it all started. I told myself, Another day, another dollar. Time to hit the road. My name is Harlan Satterfield, and I'm a truck driver for a living. Driving down Interstate 40 through New Mexico had its moments, but everything seemed peaceful that particular morning. The sunrise painted the sky in a beautiful orange hue. Nothing could have prepared me for what lay ahead. As I reached the outskirts of Tucumcari, the scenery began to change dramatically. Picturesque deserts and ranches gradually turned into something more sinister, abandoned houses, barely holding on to their last breaths. My lunch spot came into view, a small rest stop next to a dilapidated gas station on Route 84. Pulling up in my truck, I put my gloves on, and after taking a large swig from my water bottle, cracked one of my favorite jokes to myself. 
I guess they don't call this place Nowersville for nothing. I felt like this was just any other ordinary day. A fellow trucker named Wilbur Blevins, with whom I occasionally caught up at various stops during our journeys, appeared by my side. We usually talk about sports, trade road stories, or geek out about truck parts. But that day Wilbur's tone seemed off. Another driver friend of his hadn't been heard from in days after stopping somewhere near this very stretch of Route 84. As we finished our conversation, an eerie silence loomed amid the hazy atmosphere. Sensing something was amiss, we decided to take a look around and track down our friend Earl Brixton, that missing driver, starting with an old warehouse across from the gas station. Stay sharp, Harland! Wilbur whispered as we cautiously approached the building. Suddenly we heard rustling from within followed by a muffled scream that sent shivers down our spines. We looked at each other in shock, understanding the gravity of the situation. Bursting through the rotting warehouse doors, we were met by an overwhelming stench of decay. It became obvious that this was once a slaughterhouse, now transformed into a nightmarish scene straight out of a crime movie. Fighting back our nausea, we moved further into the darkness, armed with nothing but our torches. A drastic turn of events unfolded before us as we stumbled upon a large metallic cage containing Earl. He was severely injured and bruised but still breathing. Terrified and desperate, he warned us about the man who had captured him, an unrecognizable brute dressed in tattered clothes, covered in grease and grime a nameless monster who only preyed on unsuspecting victims like truckers. Ignoring Earl's pleas to get help and return with weapons, Wilbur and I knew that leaving him behind meant certain death. Prying open the cage with rusty crowbars, we stealthily led Earl out and continued deeper into the slaughterhouse. Climbing up an unstable flight of stairs to reach the upper levels, we suddenly felt deafening vibrations across the floorboards. This brute we were braving had discovered his escaped captive and decided it was time for a violent reconquest. As dread filled our veins, we shared one last glance at each other before choosing our course of action. Wilbur swiftly tried dislodging large pieces of debris obstructing our path to give us some time against this relentless monster steadily advancing from the shadows. With Earl beside us, our breathing labored as we navigated the maze of gore and darkness. Time was not on our side, with the monster's steps echoing louder behind us. The thought of calling for help crossed my mind, but the chances of anyone finding us before it was too late seemed slim. We were in a desolate part of town after all. Heading deeper into the slaughterhouse, avoiding discarded hooks and carcasses, we approached a dimly lit chamber. A massive machine loomed before us, an obsolete piece of equipment that was once used for gutting animals. Amongst the tangled mess of gears and levers, our best bet for protection was hiding here and waiting for the first opportunity to rush past our pursuer and escape. The monster's tromping grew louder. His gruesome face neared into view. His mangy hair clung to his scarred and blistered skin. A distorted grin revealed jagged teeth coated in filth. The brute held a sledgehammer that left no doubt about what he'd do with it. We crouched behind the machine, gripping each other's arms to suppress the trembling. The slightest sound might give away our position. Earl whispered, Why isn't he attacking us right away? What's he waiting for? Before I could respond, I noticed something, a fire extinguisher hanging on the wall. This could be our chance. I watched the brute's movements carefully. He circled closer, growing impatient. Mustering courage, I shushed Earl before darting out from behind the machine and grabbing the fire extinguisher. As soon as I had it in my grasp, I aimed at the brute and pulled its lever with all my might. The spray drenched his terrifying visage, momentarily blinding him as he flailed wildly with the sledgehammer. Wilbur waved at Earl and me to run while we had this opening. My heart raced as we took off, 
trying to retrace our steps through the maze of death. The echoes of carnage-filled halls mixed with the guttural howls of our enraged pursuer. We finally reached the opening to the warehouse and glanced back for Wilbur. He pointed behind him frantically. Come on! He's right there! With an almighty swing, the monster's sledgehammer connected directly with Wilbur's torso, knocking him fifty feet across the room before crashing into a wall. A sickening crunch resounded as he slumped to the ground, lifeless. Earl and I stared in horror but had no time to grieve. The grip of terror propelled us forward, out of the warehouse and onto an empty street where we dialed 911, breathlessly explaining that we found our friend Earl injured and stumbled upon a nameless monster. As sirens wailed in the distance, we realized that calling for help sooner wouldn't have made a difference. Wilbur was doomed from the moment we entered that slaughterhouse. The grievous loss of our friend is a weight that shall forever weigh heavy on our souls. Though we might never understand what drove that beast to prey on innocent lives, one thing is clear. Whenever lost souls are drawn to places holding reminders of horrifying events, darkness shall always follow them. May you find solace in knowing our story, as we continue to honor our fallen friend Wilbur, his courage etched in our memories until our dying breaths. I remember the first time I heard something was off at the Crescent Diner, a slice of Americana tucked away on a remote Colorado mountain road. My name's Zeke Muldoon. And as a truck driver, I relish any opportunity to swap stories with fellow travelers while grabbing a bite to eat. The scent of coffee, bacon, and stale cigarettes welcomed me as I kicked the dust off my boots. Hey there, Goldie! I called out to the familiar waitress behind the counter. Got anything fresh on the menu? Sure thing, Zeke. Special today is Mama Jean's chili. I grinned at her toothy smile, knowing she meant well. Little did I know that familiarity was about to take a dark turn. My good mood was interrupted by a throaty chuckle from a large man in a stained knitted cap seated near me. That's some euphemism you got there. Goldie chuckled nervously. Y'all better be careful with that humor. It was only slightly amusing. I didn't want to dwell on it but took note of the man who delivered it and went back to my meal. He kept his eyes on his plate but had an unsettling presence that was hard to miss. His unkempt beard and dirty fingernails gave me an uncomfortable feeling. In the far corner of the diner sat two men arguing in hushed voices. Their occasional harsh whisper caught my attention. Finally, curiosity got the best of me and I decided to intervene before things escalated. The sudden silence from their end made me freeze mid-step. Their faces were pale and sweaty, clear signs of fear, which confounded me even more because earlier they seemed angry at each other. They immediately waved me away before resuming their conversation, clearly not interested in discussing whatever troubling topic they had been going over. I decided it was time for a smoke screen, and outside the diner, I ran into a local deputy named Lloyd Helmsley. He was an approachable fellow who never seemed to grow tired of conversing. After exchanging small talk, I asked if he had noticed anything odd happening in the town. Tentatively, he let me in on a string of seemingly random attacks, all violent that left the victims battered or, worse, dead. No one could make sense of it or figure out who was behind it. This town's small, he stammered. Everybody knows everybody. As Lloyd finished his tale, we both heard the distinct sound of smashing glass from inside the diner. We rushed in to find one of the men from before fighting with another patron, his face furious and red with anger. The escalating chaos drew our attention as barstools became makeshift weapons and fists pounded against flesh. Lloyd tried his best to break up the violence, but ultimately called for backup and ordered a full evacuation. 
Goldie was pinned under a table as she attempted to call for help. At my insistence, she ventured outside while I offered her assistance. Despite my efforts to move her out the door, her reluctance spoke volumes. Something dark and sinister lingered far too close, ready to strike at a moment's notice. My focus honed in on that man with the dirty fingernails from earlier in the day. As our eyes locked for only a moment, I felt a sudden chill as it was apparent that this villainous character had no fear in his eyes, only determination and a truly unsettling degree of malice. He turned around and swiftly vanished into the frenzy surrounding him. Victims were falling left and right along with Lloyd's backup arriving from all directions. The case heightened at an alarming pace until it felt like everyone else had disappeared entirely. In this rapid-fire series of events, disarray now controlled every action within the diner. People scrambled for cover from the vicious mayhem. I could see Lloyd being overwhelmed by attackers just outside, and knew it was up to me if any of us were going to make it out alive. With newfound determination, I hurled myself into the fray, throwing punches and dodging flying debris. Desperation drove my movements as I lunged toward my mysterious antagonist, only to be intercepted by one of his accomplices. As the vicious man lunged his knife towards me, I quickly deflected the attack by slamming a nearby plate into his face. One of the restaurant workers attempted to intervene but found himself overpowered before he could so much as blink. The chaos in the diner continued as I pushed forward through the crowd feeling the adrenaline coursing through my veins. My attention remained on the man with the dirty fingernails, who seemed to orchestrate these brutal attacks. I looked around, searching for Goldie, hoping she had found a way out or at least a safe space to hide. But there was no sign of her amid the turmoil. The man with dirty fingernails kept a watchful eye on me as he rapidly moved through the crowd, effortlessly attacking anyone who tried to get near him. His physical strength was impressive, and his skin was covered in tattoos that told stories of violence and criminality. He maintained a sinister grin throughout the chaos, clearly taking pleasure in inflicting pain upon others. As I advanced towards him, knowing I couldn't just stand by while people were getting hurt, I was suddenly grabbed from behind by another attacker. As we struggled against each other, I managed to throw him off my back and knock him out with a well-placed punch to the jaw. Seeing this, the man with dirty fingernails stopped smirking and disappeared into the shadows outside of the diner. Dread washed over me. I knew that for us to have any chance of surviving this nightmare, I needed to stop him once and for all. Thinking quickly, I grabbed Goldie's phone from my pocket and dialed 911. My voice was shaky as I reported what was happening at the diner, but there wasn't time to wait for the police to arrive. As soon as I hung up, I sprinted outside in pursuit of my target. Just as Lloyd's backup started pulling into the parking lot, I spotted him darting behind a car in a dark corner. Realizing he was waiting for an ambush opportunity, I cautiously approached trying not to make any noise. Suddenly he lunged at me from behind another vehicle, but I swiftly dodged his attack and grabbed his wrist. We locked eyes, and I could see the malice and hatred burning in his soul. A horrid shriek escaped his lips as I twisted his arm and disarmed him painfully. With one final shove, I slammed him against the car before the police swarmed in to take control of the situation. The diner's patrons slowly emerged from their hiding places, their eyes haunted by what they had just witnessed. Lloyd approached, his face beaten and bruised but grateful that we had managed to subdue the instigator of this brutal attack. In the aftermath of this shocking ordeal, many questions remained unanswered. Who was this terrifying man with dirty fingernails? What drove him and his followers to create such chaos? As I looked at Goldie hugging her co-workers and gazing at me with silent gratitude, I realized that despite the terror we just endured, we were the lucky ones, 
we had survived. And as the authorities carried away those who had not been so fortunate, I solemnly vowed never to forget their sacrifice or take my life for granted again. I still remember that eerie night when the whole ordeal began. My name's Gareth Arnold, and I couldn't have imagined how that seemingly ordinary week at my house in the remote forests of Oregon would end up being so terrifying. i just moved into the house with my older brother, Mitchell. It was a quaint little cabin surrounded by tall trees and an eerie silence that sent chills down our spine. As days went on, we noticed weird things happening around our new home. Strange markings appeared on our porch overnight, resembling claw marks but far larger than any animal we'd seen before. Broken branches were found outside, as if something enormous had stumbled through the area. One evening, while we were sitting down for dinner, we heard something rustling outside our window. We figured it was just a wild animal passing by and brushed it off. A few hours later, while I was watching television, Mitchell barged into the living room. Hey, did you hear that? he asked. No, what? I replied. Sounds like someone's moving around outside, he said tensely. We cautiously opened the door and looked around. We saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, my eyes caught a glimpse of an enormous shadow disappearing behind a tree. Before I could say anything to Mitchell, it vanished into the darkness. Over the next few days, more signs surfaced that something otherworldly lurked in our vicinity. Mitchell and I agreed to work together to uncover the truth behind this bizarre series of events. In daylight hours, we felt somewhat secure but dreaded darkness enclosing around us each day. We finally decided it was time to take action one evening as we were both tossing uneasy glances at shadows cast by moonlight. We grabbed two flashlights and waterproof jackets then ventured into the woods from where everything seemed to be stemming. The air grew heavier as we continued deeper into the woods, entwined with fear and an inexplicable feeling that our steps would lead us to something sinister. As we walked, Mitchell cracked a joke to break the tension when we noticed something odd about the path we were on. Hey, Gareth, don't these footprints look strange to you? Mitchell asked, pointing at the ground. Indeed, they seemed abnormally large and had distinct claw marks at the edge. We followed them cautiously, our hearts pounding in our chests as we delved further into the darkness. Abruptly, we found ourselves in a small clearing where the tree canopy exposed us to the moonlight. Our flashlights illuminated an eerie scene filled with broken branches and bloodied remains of a deer. The sight was gruesome, only amplifying our rising panic. Before we could dissect what may have transpired here, we heard rustling nearby. Our hearts raced as we swiveled toward the sound only to find a horrifying figure that resembled no creature known to man. The creature was tall and lanky with elongated limbs extending from its skeletal body. Its head took the shape of a deer or stag skull adorned with sharp antlers that glistened in the moonlight. The sheer horror of its appearance stopped us dead in our tracks as it slowly shifted its gaze towards us. It didn't take long for Mitchell and me to realize that calling for help was futile. We were in a remote area where no one would be able to hear us over the rustling wind or howling wolves hidden beyond our sight. The creature started moving cautiously towards us. Its unnatural gait sent shivers down my spine. Every step it took made us want to scream for help even more but all that would do was waste oxygen amidst this dire event unfolding before us. I glanced at Mitchell for a brief second, to gauge his reaction, but as quickly as our eyes met, my gaze returned to the fearsome figure encroaching upon us. We knew we had to commit to decisive action without wasting a second. Suddenly, Mitchell darted towards the left, attracting the creature's attention. 
I seized the opportunity and ran in the opposite direction, trying to get some distance between myself and that abomination. As the creature lunged towards Mitchell, I took advantage of the distraction to take cover behind a large tree. My breasts were heavy and panicked, but my fight for survival took over any sense of fear. Mitchell had bought me some time but was now attempting to run in my direction, trying to avoid the monstrous being. The creature followed him relentlessly, its gruesome antlers closing in for an attack. Unable to scream or shout due to the gravity of our situation, I searched my surroundings for anything we could use as a weapon or a means of defense. A rock, a heavy branch, anything. Unfortunately, nothing that could aid us was in sight. Our best hope for survival was distance and evasion. As I continued moving away from the creature, circling around trees and bushes, I caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a small cabin not too far away. It wasn't much, but it could provide us with momentary respite from this nightmare. I waved at Mitchell, desperately trying to signal him without capturing the creature's attention. Thankfully, he noticed and also saw the cabin I was pointing at. We both sprinted towards it, our legs fueled by sheer adrenaline. The creature was now behind us both as we reached the cabin door. Mitchell managed to forcefully push it open just as I caught up with him. We quickly shut the door behind us and slid the rusty bolt into place. Having secured ourselves in the cabin temporarily, we immediately looked for alternate exits. There were windows on both sides. However, they were small and difficult to climb through. The entrance we barricaded remained our only viable escape route. With no phone signal to call for help and no one else around who could possibly hear us, we opted for another strategy waiting out the creature until daylight in hopes that it would lose interest or grow tired. We spoke quietly about our predicament and our next steps while listening intently for any signs of the creature's continued presence. Our conversation was punctuated by the disturbing scraping of antlers against the door, further unnerving us. Hours passed before the scratching finally ceased, and we could no longer hear its heavy breaths outside. Taking a small risk, we used the break of dawn to cautiously unlock and peek through the cabin door, noting that our tormentor seemed to have vanished. Mitchell and I seized the opportunity, sprinting away from our temporary shelter without a backward glance. The sun rose higher in the sky, while we tried to put as much distance between us and that horrific abomination as possible. As we ran deeper into the woods, we came across a tangled mess of our belongings, backpacks ripped apart, clothes strewn about, and food devoured. We knew that attempting to gather any useful items would be risky but agreed that we needed what little provisions remained. After assessing our supplies, we continued our journey towards civilization while discussing how such a grotesque creature could exist. It wasn't paranormal or legendary in nature. It was a living, breathing entity with harmful intent. Days later, bruised and battered from our ordeal, Mitchell and I finally emerged back to a populated area. Even after reaching safety physically, however, the terror of that unforgettable encounter left us emotionally scarred for life. Recounting our experience with various acquaintances made us realize that creatures like those may hold secrets that few understand. And as unsettling as it may be to acknowledge their existence, they remind us that some mysteries are best avoided. Our lives had been irrevocably changed, while fear heightened awareness served as reminders not just of our survival but also of those innocent victims who found themselves in harm's way when faced with an unearthly predator. I chuckled as I told my friend, Why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side, of course. My name is Cedric Norwood, and I found myself in a secluded part of Wyoming known as Devil's Tower National Monument. 
The tower is an impressive natural rock formation that dominates the landscape. Vast forests, river valleys, and rolling hills surrounded a stark contrast to the arid plains just miles away. I was with Blake Anderson and Justine Connors. Both are close associates of mine, who are now indulging in the sights of our location during a break from our investigative job. Blake, an expert in flora and fauna, closely examined a shrub nearby, while Justine studied her compass. Suddenly, Justine called us to attention. Guys, we need to head east from here. She said it with conviction as if her years of navigating remote areas had honed her intuition. As we followed her lead, our surroundings became increasingly dense. Thickets of trees enshrouded the entire area giving cover to an eerily silent atmosphere. The sunlight flickered through the leaves above occasionally illuminating our path. Several yards in front of us lay oddly arranged logs, seemingly moved by force out of their natural resting place. Just at that moment, we started hearing strange noises from afar, rustling sounds that deviated from that of a typical forest creature's movements. It was then that Blake caught a glimpse of something horrifying. It stood tall with elongated limbs and a lanky frame protruding high above the thicket. If not for its strikingly terrifying stag skull for a head with razor-sharp antlers atop it, it would easily pass as human. Blake didn't take long to utter his panicked realization. That thing is stalking us. None of us could call for help, as we couldn't risk revealing our position or giving away our presence to what seemed like a menacing creature. With the danger lurking, we couldn't afford to stay still. Justine murmured, Let's remember, slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. Adhering to her wise words, we continued navigating through the forest with caution, slowly, but most importantly, carefully. Advancing in a relatively straight line through the dense foliage, the rustling sounds followed us, growing more rhythmic and pronounced. Suddenly, from the bushes to our right emerged a bloodied animal carcass that hovered in the air with precision and in almost an unnatural manner. We soon witnessed its targeted destination, between our path and the ominous skull-headed creature. Realizing this could be a ploy by the creature to capture us more easily, we couldn't help but feel genuine fear and panic rising within us. Our cautious pace was soon overthrown by instinctual rush as we attempted to move away from this attacker. The stalking persisted unabatedly, as if predicting our every move. As each second passed by, I realized we needed something to slow it down. Scrounging around for anything useful from my pack, I found my pistol lying at the bottom of it. It was with reluctance that I decided to use it. Holding tightly onto my weapon, fear compelled me moments later. Its unusual form loomed ever closer within our trail, darting in between trees just out of sight range. I fired several rounds at the nightmarish being, hoping that even if it didn't kill the creature at least it would stall it for some time. Our steps gained speed after I unloaded my gun. To our relief, there seemed to be a temporary cease in its pursuit which bought us valuable seconds knowing it was right behind us. We bolted toward a clearing up ahead with renewed hope as adrenaline-fueled sorrow rushed through our veins. Blake cried out to Justine and me. This area should be lit enough to give us an advantage. No more hiding. But our momentary respite was gone in an instant. I fired my last round into the darkness hoping to slow down the relentless monster stalking us. We raced through thick foliage, our breaths ragged, sweat pouring down our faces. I could feel pain throbbing in every part of my body, but we couldn't stop now, not when we were so close to escaping. I see a cabin up ahead, Justine yelled as we approached a clearing. Our legs shook with exhaustion, but the sight of potential shelter revived a fraction of our energy. The cabin looked ancient and worn, the wood detailing rotted with decay. But any form of protection against this unstoppable creature was welcome at this point. 
Together we stumbled into the structure, panting and gasping for breath. Once inside, Blake quickly slammed the door shut and pushed a heavy piece of furniture in front of it. We didn't know if that would hold whatever beast was after us, but we hoped it would buy us some time. Justine, I whispered through labored breaths. Can you find something to block the windows? She nodded and began her search while Blake kept watch at the door. I turned to my backpack, digging deep for any form of communication so we could call for help. Eventually, my fingers landed on an old walkie-talkie I always had for emergencies when hiking deep into the woods. Panic rose within me as I desperately tried numerous channels to no avail. Static echoed through every attempted frequency, and it became clear that there was no help coming. The frustration welled up and all I wanted was to scream, but fear still silenced me. The night carried an eerie stillness that hung around us like a thick fog. For a moment, we almost allowed ourselves to think that maybe we made it out alive that whatever hunted us had given up. But then it came back. The creature burst through the floor with immense force, its bony antlers grotesquely puncturing Blake's chest instantly. Blood erupted from his body, painting the cabin walls in a visceral crimson hue. Justine and I stared, aghast as we watched our friend crumple to the ground with the monster looming overhead. Not wasting any more time, we split up Justine sprinting through one door while I took another. The creature seemed disoriented by this and hesitated momentarily before giving chase. As I ran further into the woods, my mind raced for a solution. My legs began to give out beneath me, but I knew that stopping meant certain death. That was when I stumbled upon a ravine that dropped off into near darkness below. Without hesitation, I began scaling down its steep side with a steadfast determination. Bit by bit, I felt the creature getting further away as gravity aided my descent. Hitting the cold ground below, I kept my wits about me and crept along the surface to find a hiding place large enough to obscure my presence. Eventually settling inside a small alcove hidden by an overgrowth of roots, I could hear its sharp hooves rapidly tapping on the rocks above me. The tension heightened as moments passed like hours and still the creature searched for me. Eventually, though, the sound of hoofsteps diminished and eerie silence returned once again. I can't tell how much time has passed since then. It feels as if days have merged together while remaining in my small sanctuary. Hunger gnaws at my insides and exhaustion weighs heavy on my eyelids, but adrenaline keeps me alive an ever-present reminder that Blake's horrifying fate could become mine. Justine, there's been no sign of her since we separated. I can only wish she'd somehow met with better luck than me. Despite the never-ending fear gnawing at my conscience, my thoughts raced endlessly as she made it out. Is there hope for her while none remains for me? But for now, all I can do is wait in this dark pit, hiding and praying that whatever demon was unleashed upon us never finds me again, hoping against hope for some form of rescue that may never come. For how long could I remain hidden here? A question without a definitive answer. Yet the fear of facing that bloodthirsty creature kept me going, clinging to life in front of impossible odds. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me on June 12, 1997, while on patrol in Big Bend National Park, Texas. Rugged as held down there, the kind of place that makes a man feel small. I'd been a park ranger for most of my adult life, and I thought I'd seen it all, lost hikers, the odd flash flood, even a tussle with a bear or two. But this... This was something else entirely. It started with a radio call from dispatch. A couple reported a strange sighting on the South Rim Trail, a large, bipedal creature not matching any local wildlife. They'd hightailed it out of there, understandably shaken. 
Protocol demanded I check it out, despite the absurdity of the report. Bigfoot and Big Bend, huh? I chuckled to myself as I set off towards the trailhead. But somewhere deep down, a sliver of unease crept in. I reached the South Rim Trail in the late afternoon. The sun beat down with a vengeance, baking the desert landscape. I scanned the area, no sign of the panicked couple, no fresh footprints aside from my own. Just the vast, empty beauty of the Chihuahuan Desert stretching out before me. I decided to hike a short way down the trail, just in case. First half mile was uneventful. Then, amidst the rocks and scrub brush, I saw it, a footprint. Massive, at least twice the size of my own boot, with long, clawed toes. A jolt of adrenaline shot through me. That was no bear, and certainly no hoaxer. Whatever made that track was real, and it was big. I followed the trail of prints, my heart pounding a steady rhythm in my chest. They led off the main path, towards a narrow, winding canyon. The sun was dipping lower, casting long, eerie shadows. Logically, I should have radioed for backup, turned around. But a stubborn determination fueled my steps. I had to see what made those tracks, had to prove to myself it was just some oversized critter, not the stuff of campfire legends. The canyon walls closed in around me, the air growing stiflingly still. The only sound was the crunch of my boots on gravel and the distant screech of a hawk. The prince continued deeper in. Then I rounded a bend, and my breath hitched in my throat. There, in a rocky clearing about twenty yards ahead, stood the creature. It had its back to me, hunched over a pile of something. Even from a distance, its sheer size sent a chill down my spine. My first coherent thought was bear, but bigger, much bigger than any grizzly I'd ever encountered. Then the creature turned its head, as if sensing my presence. My blood ran cold. This was no bear. Its head was huge, bald, and human. Its face elongated ending in a protruding snout filled with jagged teeth. And those eyes, small, black, and glinting with a chilling intelligence. In that moment, time seemed to slow down. The creature straightened, rising to its full height. A guttural growl rumbled in its chest. And it stood well over eight feet tall, covered in a coarse, dark brown fur. Every instinct screamed at me to run but my feet fell rooted to the spot. It was like staring into something primeval, something that defied reason. Then it charged. Not the lumbering gait of a bear, but with a swiftness that defied its size. I snapped out of my daze, fumbling for my rifle. I fired, more out of a desperate need to do something than with any real hope of stopping it. The creature stumbled letting out a roar that echoed through the canyon. I fired again and again, my shots hitting their mark, yet they seemed to do little more than enrage the beast. It was closing in fast, those wicked claws outstretched. Panic kicked in. I turned and ran. Stumbled down the narrow canyon path, the creature's roars and the pounding of its feet close behind me. The terrain was rough, treacherous, and I nearly twisted my ankle twice. Up ahead, a flicker of hope the canyon opened up slightly, leading to a wider wash. If I could just reach it, maybe I could put some distance between us. A surge of adrenaline gave me a final burst of speed. I stumbled into the wash, sucking in ragged breaths. I turned, raising my rifle, expecting to see the creature lunge out of the canyon at any moment. But nothing came. Silence settled thick over the desert. I waited, strained my eyes towards the canyon entrance, my heart lodged in my throat. After what felt like an eternity, I cautiously lowered my rifle. Still nothing. Whatever it was, 
It had retreated, for now. I inched my way back towards the canyon entrance, gun raised, ready for another attack. But there was no sign of the creature. No blood trail, only those monstrous footprints disappearing back up the canyon. Had it only been wounded? Waiting for me to make a mistake? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. I had to get out of there. I turned and jogged back towards the main trail, breaking into a full sprint the moment the canyon was out of sight. I radioed for backup, my voice hoarse with fear and exertion. The words sounded ridiculous even to my own ears. Unknown creature, possible threat, requesting immediate assistance. The sun was setting as I reached my truck. Backup arrived shortly after, a whole unit of them, armed to the teeth. They found no carcass, no injured creature. Just my story and those monstrous footprints. They sent me home on mandatory leave after that. Not surprising, given the unusual nature of my report. Doctors were brought in, poking and prodding, asking if I'd hit my head, if I'd always been one for tall tales. It was humiliating. Made me question my own sanity for a while. But I knew what I saw. They wrote it off as an animal attack, maybe a misidentified bear, they said maybe a rogue wolf. Whatever the official report stated, I could see the doubt in their eyes. I was. Ranger Ellis, the guy who saw Bigfoot. Couldn't go back to work for a time. Not Big Bend, not anywhere. The nightmares were relentless. The creature's inhuman face, the bloodlust in its eyes, the feeling of those monstrous claws inches from my flesh. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, gasping for air. I ended up taking odd jobs, manual labor, anything to keep my mind occupied, my hands calloused. Drifted for a while, trying to leave that canyon, that creature, behind me. One day, about a year later, a package arrived. No return address, just my name scrawled on it. Inside was a newspaper clipping and a note. The clipping was from a local rag up in Wyoming reporting a string of missing persons around Yellowstone Park. The note was short, written in a shaky hand. They're spreading. It wasn't just you. My blood turned to ice. The Yellowstone disappearances had made national news, but the theories were the usual. Animal attacks, inexperienced hikers, bad luck. But this note, it was confirmation that I was right all along. Those creatures weren't isolated, and the official cover-ups were only going to help them thrive. And in that moment, something shifted inside me. The fear and helplessness were still there, but they were outweighed by a burning anger. These creatures had preyed on innocent people, hikers, campers, maybe others who, like me, saw a glimpse of the truth and were dismissed as crazy. Those creatures were a danger— a cancer on the wild places that were supposed to be safe. They needed to be stopped. I wouldn't let others suffer the same way I had. I cashed out my meager savings, bought a heavy-duty truck, outfitted it for long-term off-grid living. The plan was simple, as insane as it sounded. I'd follow the disappearances, track those things down. Document them, gather proof. I couldn't kill them, but maybe I could expose them. Warn people. I had the skills, the woodsman's intuition. I'd spent years surviving in the backcountry. Now I'd become the hunter instead of the hunted. It was a desperate, possibly suicidal plan. But sitting back, doing nothing while people vanished into the wilderness, I couldn't live with that choice, not anymore. The next day, I loaded up my truck and hit the road, heading north. Wyoming was the first stop, but I knew it wouldn't be the last. My quest, if you could call it that, had begun. And it wouldn't end until the truth was out there, or I was dead. One or the other. 
My journey took me to the remote corners of America. I followed rumors and reports of strange sightings, venturing into places most people avoided, deep forests, desolate swamps, rugged mountain ranges. Locals often looked at me like I was mad. Some had their own stories, whispered around campfires, about things lurking in the shadows. But most dismissed me as another Bigfoot nut, a conspiracy theorist chasing shadows. I kept meticulous records, every footprint, every torn-up campsite, every eerie howl in the night. My truck became a mobile command center, crammed with maps, field guides, and enough firepower to start a small war. With each new clue, a pattern started to emerge. The attacks were sporadic but escalating. These creatures were intelligent, adaptable. They were learning. I came face to face with them three more times over the years. Once in the dense redwood forests of Northern California, once in the alligator-infested swamps of the Everglades, and lastly, in an abandoned mining town deep in the Alaskan wilderness. Each encounter was harrowing, pushing me to the breaking point. Each time, I barely escaped with my life. News of my crusade leaked out into certain circles. I became a sort of shadowy figure, part boogeyman, part folk hero, amongst those who believed there were more things out there than met the eye. A few even contacted me with their own stories, tips, sometimes pleas for help. One such message was from a woman named Sarah, her voice trembling on the voicemail she left. Sarah's brother, an avid hiker named Ethan, went missing in the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. The official search was called off, but Sarah refused to give up hope. She'd heard whispers about my work, my reputation. Begged me to come, to try where others had failed. Something in her desperation sparked a flicker of recognition. The Olympic Peninsula, dense old-growth forests, remote trails. It fit the pattern. And if there was a chance Ethan was still alive, a chance those creatures held him. I couldn't say no. I arrived in the small town near the park a few days later. Sarah was waiting, a haunted look in her eyes. She clung to my presence as if I were a lifeline. We went through Ethan's last known movements, poring over maps and trip itineraries. It was a shot in the dark, I warned her, but she nodded grimly, the fire of determination burning bright. I respected that in her, recognized a mirroring of my own obsession. I ventured into the heart of the Olympics alone. It was slow, methodical work, days of scouring the forest floor, studying tracks, marking potential territory on my map. Those woods felt different, even to me. An oppressive silence hung over everything, a sense of being watched. It put me constantly on edge. One evening, as the sun began to dip below the canopy, I saw them again. Not just one this time. Three figures, hulking in the twilight. One was the massive creature I'd seen all those years ago in Big Bend, its size somehow even more terrifying now. The other two were smaller, but still monstrous. My heart hammered against my ribs, but the fear was laced with a white-hot rage. Something had changed. These creatures, they were bolder. I watched from my vantage point as they stalked a family of deer, their movements coordinated and chillingly efficient. Unlike those first desperate attacks in the desert and the swamps, this was a practice hunt. They were getting better, stronger. Humanity, we were underestimating the threat. 